Welcome to the podcast. It's dedicated to making you a faster cyclist. The Ask a Cycling Coach podcast presented by Trainer Road. I'm Coach Jonathan Lee, and joining you from the home studio today, instead of joining you from the Trainer Road studios, we also have Chad Tim, our head coach, Chad Timmerman, joining us from his home studio. What's up, Chad? Hi, everybody. And we also have Ice Friction and Specialized Alex Wild. What's up, Alex? Hey, everyone. Uh, it's going to look a little weird today because I don't have my normal setup. So I'm going to be like looking down at you guys and looking up at the camera. So if you're joining us on YouTube, which you can, it's every Thursday at 8 a.m. Pacific, uh, you can watch us as well. Uh, so I'm, I'm not sure you want to see our ugly mugs just the same. It's just the three of us today. <laughs> but hey, uh, you're welcome to join us there. Join in on the live chat. And uh, we're happy to have everybody joining us there on YouTube. If you're listening to this now, one of the best ways you can do to, the best ways you can help this podcast is to share it with other people. It makes other cyclists faster. Uh, it'll make your friends faster. So maybe you want to be careful who you share it with if you want to beat your friends. But hey, just the same, uh, share it with them. Let them know. We're going to talk a lot about strength training today. We're also going to talk about uh, some high volume training from Alex's experience and stuff he's doing, and kind of. Uh, play back and forth on that and also some goal setting. But first we wanted to wish Ivy well. She was supposed to be with us today, but she's feeling under the weather. Uh, so she's not with us. Um, before we start, one quick suggestion or request, I guess I would say, for anybody listening to this, if uh, adaptive training has been hugely successful at helping athletes get faster, it's awesome to see. And if you've accomplished anything, whether that's an improvement in fitness or whether it's a race that you've done or any other goal with the help of adaptive training, I'd love to have you reach out and let us know. You can do so. Just go to trainerroadcom slash podcast, the same spot where you submit your questions and let us know. I would love to hear those stories and maybe we could share them on the successful athletes podcast. Uh, with that said, uh, let's jump into, I guess, a discussion on New Year's resolutions. Why not? Uh, we typically did like a whole thing where we had a, a proper reckoning where we reviewed the previous years and went forward. And I did not prepare that this year. And that seemed to add a whole lot of stress to a lot of people. Nate, it seemed to, you know, Nate thrived on that, but it seemed to add a whole <laughs> lot of stress. So instead, we're going to keep it more forward looking right now. Uh, and we'll all assume that we're great at following up and measuring success. Uh, cause those are keys. Uh, but Chad, do you want to kick us off? Do you have any goals for the year, uh, for this year coming up in terms of cycling or anything else? I actually don't. I, I have zero goals and there's a couple of reasons for that. First, first off I'm gun shy because I don't like being held accountable for things that <laughs> are in front of, lofty. in front of tens of tens and tens and tens of thousands of people, Chad, you don't like yeah. that? <laughs> no, I mean that, that influences it, but not as much as being held accountable by Nate. He's pretty cruel <laughs> with his judgment. Yeah. Um, he is. And frankly, I'm, I'm turning 50 in a couple of weeks here. And I feel like I'm kind of over this whole resolving to do things differently. I, I've, I've figured out mm. what works it's for me and I'm just going to stay that <laughs> course. <laughs> <laughs> I like it. How about you, Alex? Um, this may seem very grinchy of me, but I, <laughs> I'll go with that time as a human construct and new year's isn't a, necessarily a time to set goals. <laughs> okay. Uh, I, I kind of just set goals as, as time goes on. So I've never really participated in new year's resolutions, so to speak. Mm -hmm. Um, I will say I have very much enjoyed the increase in cyclists to wave at on the roads over the last five days. So for everybody whose resolution was to ride more bikes, Hey, it's working. <laughs> <laughs> That's cool. I, I, I have, I have three. So, uh, first it's strength training last year. I was pretty good at hitting one to two strength sessions a week. This year, I want to hit three strength sessions a week. That doesn't mean I'm going to get really swole. I just noticed a really big improvement on the bike. I also noticed a big improvement in terms of just general life, uh, removing soreness and everything else that comes with it. I was also more flexible. I could do more things outside of just riding my bike. Um, when I did three strength sessions a week versus when I did two or one, I felt better. So a goal of mine is to hit three strength sessions every week. And it's you know, timely for today's podcast. So that's one. Uh, that's one thing that I can do as well. That's uh, different than me saying like, I want to increase my bicep circumference to X or something like that. <laughs> but so that you do, a, right? That would be an unimpressive <laughs> number anyway, <laughs> but instead it's about what I can control. So I'm going to want to hit those three sessions. So that's one thing. Uh, He's next, just going to measure the core to Swiss sleeve. Yeah. <laughs> Must not be bigger than this. Got to save yeah. the extra small skin too. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Uh, next one is to, and this is going to, probably, I don't know, probably not be a shock to podcast listeners, but to complete a triathlon this year, uh, is a goal of mine. So, uh, 
this year, and this is going to be news to everybody listening on the podcast. Uh, it will, I think also be news maybe to you guys as well, but we have a little one coming another addition to our family in midsummer, uh, which is super exciting. So with that coming and having gone through that before, uh, just with one kid, I know that, you know, everything else goes out the window when you have a child and it's super important to be able to prioritize your child, your child's care and time with your child. So as a result, what I've found is that over the years to move the PR needle, in other words, to like, to reach unprecedented territory with cycling, I have to put in high volume training plans. And then I have to add, maybe add on some extra time. And that all that time on the bike pulls me away from family. Cause I can't be like, Hey son, like let's go out and do 10 by 10 today. Uh, he's not really, you know, my five-year-old's not going to be into that much less the baby, uh, or let's go out and do a four hour, five hour ride on the Saturday. And that, that time tends to take away from my family. So, and I know this sounds weird to a lot of people. Cause they're like, all right, so now you'll do three sports, but with draft <laughs> on, I can do, uh, less, I can probably maintain a decent amount of bike fitness with a lot less volume. Uh, I can mix the running side with pushing a stroller with the kids, right. Or having Simon, my, our five-year-old, he can ride his bike alongside me while I jog with the stroller with the small one for swimming. Uh, we have a, a pool in our neighborhood and I can go swim there and play around with the kids and just mix in because but it's not just swimming laps that helps me at this point. It's just being more familiar and comfortable in the water that also helps me at this point. So there's a lot of things I can do to kind of mix those things and make it so that endurance sport doesn't pull me away from my family uh, at a time where it's really critical. So uh, I'm pivoting over to triathlon for the year. Xterra would be my main focus. Uh, and I don't know if I'll be able to do a race just because of the schedule that Xterra has. I'm not going to travel for races this year. Um, after, uh, you know, once we get a few months in more into the pregnancy, I'm not going to travel anymore so I can be home. Uh, and the only one that's close to us is not August, like late August. So <laughs> that'll be kind of, uh, that's once the baby will be here. So I'm not planning on doing that. I might just do a solo try. So I know the course that they use for Xterra Lake Tahoe really well. So I might end up just doing that one solo maybe doing like a, a sprint or an Olympic or something else before then that's uh, on road. I don't know. But anyways, uh, if y'all want to give me try tips, I'm welcome. Uh, I, I welcome all of them. So please head over, uh, follow me on Instagram, the Jonathan underscore, uh, follow all of us on there and make fun of me for defecting from cycling and going to triathlon. I will retain my socks. Don't worry, Chad. So, um, but that's the other goal is to do a triathlon. And then the last goal that I have is to beat a PR on a local segment that we have called Geiger, not the work trainer road workout, but it's a climb. Uh, my fastest time up the climb is 34 minutes. Uh, it's like a, hmm, I guess, context on this climb. I think Chad, isn't it about six miles? Is that right? I think it's six miles. It's been a while for you. Six, seven ish. Yeah. I'm yeah. Yeah. Somewhere six to seven miles and it climbs, you know, about 2,500 feet somewhere around there. And it's like a benchmark climb is who knows if this is actually true. Greg Lamond, uh, I'm sure you're listening, so you can tell us, <laughs> but, uh, he's, it, it's said that like, it was his, uh, benchmark climb for the tour de France and everything else back in the day. And if he could climb it in something like under 32 minutes or under 30 minutes, he was in with a shot sort of a thing. So, uh, my goal is to climb it in 32 minutes this year. So, it's going to involve me, uh, with the try stuff. I don't know. We'll see how that goes. I don't know if it's possible, but that's a goal. So those are my three, uh, for the bike. Um, now, and if anybody wants to uh, share their goals or anything else with us and ask about goal setting, let us know, but we've talked a bunch about that in the past. Uh, maybe we'll talk about that in the upcoming episode with Amber and Nate and everybody else, where we talk a bit more about measuring their goals and how they go through with that, but it'll be a good one. Chad, deep dive time. Let's, uh, Still. Oh, wait, one thing before we go any further too, I should mention, I, I just did a mini training camp for a week down with, uh, I went down to Tucson, Arizona to go to, to get out of the cold and to get to the warm. And I think it barely climbed above 50 degrees Fahrenheit. Mm -hmm. And it was just raining on us and blowing wind and cold and miserable. Uh, but it was a good training camp, just trying to hold on to Keegan's wheel for the whole week. Um, I just wanted to share some learnings, uh, pros. Once again, I've said this many times, they will eat you under the table. Uh, they eat more <laughs> than you. 
They are really good at keeping up on nutrition while they're on the bike. This goes for Sophia and Keegan. Um, they're also really good at the process that makes you faster. Their whole entire life is modeled around it. And they're really good at that. So they simply don't miss their stretching, uh, and mobility session in the evenings. They simply just don't miss the gym time when they get done with their rides, they clean their stuff up and they get it ready for the next day. It's, it's just, you know, it's, it's doing all the right things. And it was just really inspiring and, and cool to see athletes so focused in their craft, uh, being able to accomplish all that. And I did the Tucson shootout, the famous group ride that they had. It was, uh, let's see, it was Quinn Simmons, his younger brother, Colby Simmons, which everybody should absolutely watch out for. Um, he's incredibly strong. Uh, who else? Um, Matthew, Matthew Riccatello. He's an up and coming, uh, road racer. That's going to absolutely, uh, make, uh, put the U S in a great spot in the road scene. Jimmy, Jimmy Riccatello's kid. Yeah. Yep. Jimmy Riccatello's kid. Uh, he might be one of the best climb time trialists that our country will ever have. Uh, who knows? We'll see. That's the, that's the word on the streets. He's a uh, incredibly small and still has a high power or high amount of power. And boy, that kid can time trial. <clears throat> so pretty exciting. Uh, Kyle Trudeau, Sophia, and like a handful of other people. And, uh, turns out that Quinn Simmons and Colby Simmons are really fast and they hurt a lot and they drop me like a bad habit. So, uh, but it was still fun. Uh, good times riding with those, with that group, really fast athletes. So, uh, okay. With all that said, let's get into the deep dive chat. We talked a few episodes ago. I want to say that maybe it was 342. Uh, 343. we talked 343. Thanks, Chad. We talked all about strength training, uh, from the like science and basically the mechanism level. We talked about that overlap that exists where people, the, the fear is that if you do strength training and you do aerobic conditioning at the same time, endurance training, that they overlap, the signals get crossed and you don't get the desired adaptations out of either. We kind of debunked that. We showed that while mechanistically that may look like that's the case in terms of performance outcomes and studies, it hasn't backed that up. We haven't been able to find that. Now, today, we want to take that and, and kind of make the rubber meet the road a bit, if you will. So talk about how we apply all that knowledge. And Alex, I know that you are a regular strength trainer. You share that on your Instagram, and you've talked about it here on the podcast before. I just so, take well, photos of my gym three times a week and then <laughs> leave. Here's where I would work out. <laughs> so let's gotcha. talk. We'll, we'll talk all about strength training. Chad, where do you want to kick it off? All three of us will be able to contribute here, but where do you want to start? For sure. So first off, it may be 342. Now that I think about it, I, I can't remember the last time I was on here. It's been a week or two weeks, but it's 342 or 343. Shouldn't be too hard to track down, but it is uh, part one of this two-parter and it dealt with the interference effect. And I wanted to make this one a bit more practical. So uh, do trust that all this is science-backed. I have done the reading quite literally over the last couple of decades really, but super hard over the last month or so, just trying to refresh and discover what new learnings may have surfaced. And then of course, I'm a huge proponent or very avid reader of the mass, uh, what is it? Monthly applications in strength sport from science and, uh, sorry, stronger by science. Those guys Fantastic handle, handle the strength the side of things. I hope as well as we handle the endurance side of things, we're probably a lot better considering they're all legit researchers. Uh, in any case, if you're interested in the strength science side of things, that is a fantastic resource. Mm -hmm. Okay. So first off, uh, I, I need to set the stage. What we're going to do today is go through just a host of questions that we've gotten that all relate to strength training. Um, these are questions we've seen cropped up again and again and again and again. And now we're finally going to address them all in one fell swoop because each of them didn't really merit a deep dive, but they definitely merited a thoughtful answer. So going to, going to do that before I get to the questions though, I just want to kind of set the stage with a, with a bit of a preamble, starting with the value of strength training for endurance athletes, not to get too scientific on it, but we're, we're chasing particular adaptations. Um, some of them are muscular tendon is stiffness. You know, we don't want the, the work we're putting into the pedals or into the road as a runner to be absorbed by our joints. So a certain level of stiffness is, is a sought after desired thing muscle unit recruitment and synchronization. Basically we want to get a lot of muscles and we want them to work effectively together, not against one another rate coding, which is basically the, the rate at which they fire, uh, intra and intermuscular coordination. So get rid of those two big words and just coordination. 
uh, neural inhibition. We want muscles to shut off when we're done with them. We don't want antagonist muscles to resist them. And, and, and all of these things basically improve our neuromuscular communication. So the communication that takes place between our neural system, so our, our central nervous system and the muscles themselves. And the takeaway here is that all this plays into something that's very relatable to us, something we seek, cycling economy. So we're trying to improve our efficiency. On top of that, bigger muscles, bigger muscle fibers can do more work. And really the, the simple takeaway there is that when we increase our anaerobic power and then our anaerobic capacity, which is simply the buffering so that we can draw that power out to longer, longer durations, these are, these are things we're looking for via strength training. These are things we can affect. The why of strength training for endurance athletes is that low force or really endurance contractions are pretty ineffective in this neuromuscular realm. They're also pretty ineffective in promoting bone growth. And this is especially true for roadies. It's less true for mountain bikers, for uh, multi-sport athletes who do running, for track sprinters or sprinters, because you know they're, they're doing harder contractions. It, it, and it does extend a bit to interval work, but no topic for another time. So, but if you're a roadie and you're largely doing long days, you're never exerting yourself in terms of in terms of the force necessary to turn the pedal each time, I mean, thousands and thousands and thousands of repetitions, but none of them are high force. So they don't carry with them the benefits that we're seeking when we strength train. Okay. So Chad, there are one, one quick thing, really quick on, on the high force part, because a lot of people would say that like, yeah, well, you know, I mix in a sprint or I do like, you know, some sprints and that's mm. high force, but we've talked about that before. That's still very different than, than specific strength training efforts, right? Uh, it's, it's still not as hard as you think it would be in terms of yeah, like that, that force structure still doesn't get the job done. Like you, like you want. Yeah. It might be useful in some ways and it might kind of lean towards some of these objectives or these, these physiological adaptations that we're seeking, but it's, it's not going to carry the weight of it. It's, it's just mm -hmm. not enough, frankly. Mm -hmm. And really, I mean, even a sprint, if it's carried out over anything more than like five or six seconds is starting to become increasingly aerobic anyway. So so just apples and oranges here. <clears throat> okay. So there are many goals of adding strength training workouts to our endurance training, but primarily we're after one thing and that's functional strength. And I know that's kind of a buzzy term, but we want functional strength that leads to improved endurance performance. We're not concerned with greater force cap capabilities when we lift heavy or by lifting heavy. We're not increased with, or, or we're not fascinated or seeking increased rate of force development. We're not trying to be able to bring more muscles on board more rapidly through plyometric and explosive activities. Those are things we can seek once the foundation is laid, but research supporting the claims of endurance performance improvement via these methods, heavy strength training, explosive strength, strength training is not as unequivocal. It's still a bit ambiguous as we're led to believe. Um, and, and for a number of reasons, I mean, the studies are always small. They, they'll take, you know, 15 subjects and split them into a, a, a control side. So an endurance side, and then an endurance and strength side, and you're left with seven athletes and that's not nothing. There's still useful findings, but it is a small data pool, um, various designs. They, they're just, they're, they're incomparable. So when you try to sum these up in a systematic review, pretty tough, uh, confounding factors, whether they're controlled or uncontrolled, make their way into it. Um, the rep ranges are well outside the heavy range. I mean, when we talk about heavy strength training, we're talking about one to three reps, maybe three to five reps. And a lot of these studies are talking about eight to 10 reps. It's just not the same thing. So I, I just can't place as much faith in those studies as I used to. Um, and, and that's influenced by other findings as well. So in my humble opinion, I do believe that a lot of these studies miss the mark by misattributing their performance increases to the wrong factors. And that's, that's a topic for a whole other time. In fact, that'd be a great science of getting faster topic. Um, <clears throat> in addition to that, strength training benefits are, are far wider ranging than the literature would have us believe. They, they try to pin it down to things that are just too specific. And I believe the benefits are just wider period. So it's my contention that the, the forms of strength training that lay the stage for this heavier, this explosive lifting are the true benefactors to endurance performance. And whether you agree with me or disagree with me, these are the forms of strength training that have to be done anyway, because if you're going to work up to those other forms of lifting, you have to lay the foundation. So do them worry about going heavy. If, when you get to a place where you can lift heavy without a high risk of injury. So I know this is, this is like, uh, Alex, were you tempted when you first started strength training to, cause so 
typically it's like, all right, get your one rep max. And from your one rep max, you scale everything out. And then from the strength training side, not the cyclist side, the, the strength training side, there's like this temptation to, to dwell closer to your one rep max and to look at those days where, you know, from the uneducated strength training side, I should say from the newbie side to it, it's like, yeah, well, you know, if you're doing eight to 12 reps or something like that, then that's not even really, you know, that's not even making you really strong or that's not accomplishing the objective. That's kind of the newbie perspective. Did you face that temptation, Alex, when you started strength training as an endurance athlete? Uh, yeah. I mean, I just load all the plates on, take the photo and then lift <laughs> afterwards. But, um, yeah, I think, I think everybody falls into that trap and with most things being honest with yourselves is super useful and it's not obviously necessarily for Instagram, but it's like, you want to be able to lift more, you know, you're, we're so used to Watts more Watts is, is better. So more weight must be better as well, but really understanding that doing the motion incorrectly with more weight is worse and not achieving what you're looking for than less weight doing the motion correctly. So it's like, if you're, you know, jerky through the motion or, you know, not getting the full range of motion on the workout or, you know, and it exacerbates anything. Like what if your right knee is kicking out just a little bit? It's like, if you're doing that with a ton of weight, you're going to feel it. But mm -hmm. if you really go like when I first hop in the gym after my two weeks off, I'm doing just the bar on most things. And that's just watching form. Like I have the mirror in front of my squat rack, making sure knees are tracking well, making sure like just the, like the mental cues are there. Like I'm driving through my heels that like I'm stacked at the top when we're, when it's coming to deadlifts or squats that, you know, for deadlifts, like I'm scraping the bar against my shins, like just those cues each time I'll do probably a couple of weeks of, of just body weight focused exercises so that it's, it's mental, like it's just memory after that. And then I'll slowly stack on weight. Um, I think it's a good opportunity too, because as you first get in the gym, that bar can still feel heavy. And then as Chad's talked about in the past, you get that, um, is it neuromuscular connection when, when you get the big jump in, in weight, even though you haven't got any stronger as your body kind of re gets into the gym. Mm -hmm. And so it's a good opportunity during that time where you can't lift as much to use it, to to really focus on form so that when you do start stacking on weight, the form's already there. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's sure. teed me up perfectly because that's those neural, uh, that neural reinforcement that you receive by starting light and just drilling the movements is <clears throat> one of the uh, key ways in, in basically focus on what I want most athletes to take away from this talk is that one of our two objectives, and I'm getting a little ahead of myself is minimizing injury. This should be at the forefront of all our, all athletes' minds. It doesn't matter if you're strength training, endurance training, concurrent training, it applies to all of us. So in line with that to what I believe to be the two most overlooked objectives when it comes to strength training should be injury avoidance and fatigue management. And the fatigue management is, is a bit more geared toward endurance athletes. So when it comes to injury that can derail everything. I mean, it, it, even the smallest injuries can be just a, a tremendous setback. When it comes to fatigue, if you mismanage your fatigue, that can compromise the quality of all your workouts. So you're doing the work, but you're just not gaining as much of the benefit from it as you could be if you manage your fatigue better. Mm -hmm. Both of these require patience, big word or big important word there. This is a process and it's a gradual one. And we as endurance athletes can come into strength training and, and other things, other forms of endurance training and be misled because we've got big engines, we've got big fitness. And we've talked many times about how the cycling and running interaction are, are a perfect example of this. You got a big engine, you can do a lot of work, but this results in connective tissue damage or injury and often enough long recovery trajectories, because first off that tissue takes a long time to heal. Secondly, most of us don't want to wait for it to heal completely. So as soon as we're feeling reasonably good again, we're going to start to pile load on. And if we're getting through that, even if it takes five minutes to get through that first rough patch, we're back on track. Everything's good. I'm healed. So I'm really going to go for it today. And, and, and we just prolong that recovery process. And the reason for this, this injury is that muscle tissue responds relatively quickly to strength training, but connective tissue does not. And because of this, it's the, it's the first of many reasons that I favor kind of what Alex just described, lighter load, higher rep schemes. And he described it for a brief period. I'm going to take it even further and, and we'll get to that. But 
that these our connective tissue responds best to frequent loading. And, and really, I believe it comes down to uh, increased doses of blood and therefore nutrients. And while we're on this topic, I do suggest that uh, for the readers out there, a book by Matt Perryman titled Squat Every Day is, Jonathan alluded to this, the more frequently he lifts, the better he feels, the better he moves. And there are reasons behind that. And there are a lot of interesting insights in this book. Honestly, it, it sounds so flattering, but this is the book I would have written. This, the, we're, I'm so in line with the, the way this guy thinks. It's, it's fascinating. A really good read. Okay, so, so that's running, but it's also easy to overdo strength training. Uh, and in particular, it's too much volume in addition to the volume of endurance training we're already doing. And a couple of things are going to happen. A lot of things are going to happen, but a couple of them are that central fatigue ensues. And that means everything suffers. If, if your brain doesn't have both hands on the wheel, everything's going to suffer to some extent. Peripheral fatigue ensues so in the muscles. And that means what I just talked about is that your quality suffers. And on top of that, the likelihood of injury is going to escalate. So because of these two things and a number of others, a real focus on fatigue management is absolutely necessary. And it's for this reason, and I'm getting a little ahead of myself again, that I cap strength training workouts at 30 minutes. I even try to keep them closer to 20 minutes in the beginning. Doesn't mean you can't grow them past that, but starting any more than that is a recipe for, for burnout, potential injury, discouragement, all of that. That's like a huge trigger point for cyclists too, because it's like, well, I'm used to doing something for two hours. Oh, so Totally. And especially if you go to a gym and there's so many things you can do at that gym, right? Like so many different pieces of equipment that you could use and you could spend the whole, you could spend the whole day there. So it's mm -hmm. really easy. It, we see this with running too, when cyclists get out there and they're like, I only ran for 15 minutes. Like, no, I run, you know, I ride my bike for two hours and that's a normal workout. So I'm going to keep going. And then you end up destroying your legs completely. Mm -hmm. You have to start out small. And even then, like with strength training, they're really for the intents and purposes of a cyclist that is using strength training. There's no benefit to you putting in a long, big, gigantic set in at there, or like, you know, a circuit, anything else that you're doing there at the gym. It's just uh, about mm -hmm. being strategic about it. You know, well, it's a I, totally was, different approach. <laughs> when I was coming through the document, I did come across one question that we didn't include in the 14 that are coming up, by the way, it, <laughs> it uh, it said something about my next strength training session, blah, 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 60 to 90 minutes. And as soon as I saw that, I thought, are you a strength athlete? Because if you're an endurance athlete, you are getting it wrong. That is too much time to spend in the gym because unless you're doing it once a week and then what's the point of it anyway, but yeah, 20 to 30 minutes. I mean it start there. You can always grow it later. Same goes with running as Jonathan just mentioned. I mean, I, when I started training for triathlon, they were 15 minute runs and I was pretty you stack a few of those in a week and I had sore knees, sore hips. I mean, things were not ready for that type of abuse. I had never exposed my body to it. Even though I was very fit as a cyclist, my joints were not prepared, but I did it slowly and I paid attention to the people who had a lot of experience and it did pay off. Yeah. It's a, uh, yeah. Fantastic points to make Chad. I'm going to read first, the first question. Everybody ready? Here we go. <laughs> uh, when should I schedule my strength training in relation to my trainer road endurance training days? So this is probably the most common question we get with strength training. And I'm going to start to close my blinds because I'm looking washed out here. I apologize to everybody on YouTube. Go You're a little ahead, pale there, bro. Okay. <laughs> I mean, it's honest. But... Okay. So um, in the context of trainer road training plans, low, mid, high volume, uh, with, with low volume, it's really pretty straightforward because you're on for three days and you're off for four days. So as long as you separate your strength training by 48 hours, which the literature does seem to all point to, that's an optimal range for muscle recovery and not too long before you start to detrain, uh, that, that would mean something like a Monday, Wednesday, since you're riding the bike Tuesday, Thursday, Saturday, um, or a Wednesday, Sunday, obviously, if you're not endurance training on those days, move things around, but do try to give yourself a couple of days between strength training sessions. Mm -hmm. gets a little trickier when you move into mid volume and high volume, you're faced with basically two options. You either have to double up because we're, we're shooting for, and we'll get to this, but a couple of days a week, maybe three, but let's just focus on two for now. You're either going to have to double up or you're going to have to use your recovery days. Now recovery day strength training is always an option, but you have to be mindful because even a low quality kind of fatigue strength training session can interrupt your endurance training recovery. It can also place a bit of stress on your whole nutrition uh, recovery, really. If you're trying to reload stores, but you're doing more work on top of it, 
well, you better be eating more to get on top of it. And also hoping that you're assimilating that, not that nutrition and it's the right kind. And it gets a little tricky. <clears throat> so do, do, do recognize that there are nutritional challenges on top of the recovery ones and two really do go hand in hand. Additionally, a single workout can actually impact many that follow. And this ties to the same things, fatigue and energy stores. So once you're behind it, it's really hard to get back in front of it unless you're you know, cognizant of it. So Alex, how do you stack your uh, strength training workouts in relation to the endurance training workouts? Um, I normally do strength training. So my cycling week is Tuesday through Sunday with Monday always off. Um, and then I do my strength training Tuesday, Thursday, and Saturday. Um, and that tends to normally fall that Tuesday and Saturday are more structured, bigger days. And Thursday is normally like, a some, some sort of zone two workout. And so when you say structured bigger days, are you talking higher intensity interval work? Yeah. More, more like threshold or sweet spot stuff. Um, everything's structured obviously, but mm -hmm. more like going above zone two on those days. And then Thursday tends to be more of a zone two endurance ride. So what I'll do is I'll do gym first thing in the morning and then try to get three hours between gym and riding and ride in the afternoon. One thing that we've mentioned is that if you're new to strength training, you don't want to go into lifting that bar and doing these movements if you're fatigued, right? So, uh, Alex has time, uh, doing strength training. So he understands the proper technique. If you do a work, a workout on your bike and you're just completely thrashed, and then you go and you try to have coordination and be able to lift properly with good technique, that can be tricky. You'll, you'll get used to it over time and you'll be able to do it afterward. If you need to, it'll be no issue. You'll be able to do it beforehand, vice versa. And it really will come down to like preference of what you want to do. For me, I like putting my bike work first when possible. Like if I, if my schedule allows it, I prefer to put my bike work first and then strength training second, because I'm not pushing my one rep max. I'm not doing anything where I'm like, oh, this is really like a, you know, th I'm compromising my ability to complete my strength workout with my bike work. That's never the case. Yeah, uh, I just sure. like, I just like to usually get the bike stuff done better. That said, my routine and my schedule usually favors doing strength training earlier in the morning versus riding the bike and doing a longer workout earlier in the morning. So you have to experiment and see what works best. And along the lines of experimentation, you also have to find out what works best for you in terms of pairing it with intense days or pairing it with less intense days. Mm -hmm. And for me, if I'm doing a higher volume plan, I am not going to stack the strength training on easy days. I'm going to stack it on the harder days. And that may seem counterintuitive, but what I'm going for there is that I want those easier days to be more easy. I don't want to make an easy day harder than it should because I need that midweek replenishment, right? I need to be able to carry a little less fatigue into the subsequent workouts. So yeah. in that case, I'll do it on the harder days. Um, I'll do it afterward in that case too, if the bike work is really strenuous, yeah, like you never want to let strength training compromise your bike training. If bike training is your main goal, that's like that just the, the number one rule to keep in mind. So however yeah, you need to structure it, it all depends on that, right? Chad? It's, in, it's important to recognize that there's, there's a neural component with everything we do in terms of physical stress, but there's a far greater neural component typically on the strength training side of things. So that neural fatigue can, can, Heftily, heftily impact everything you're trying to do, which may not be a big deal if you're neurally fatigued and you're just going to go out and ride for an hour and a half at 60% of your FTP. But if you have to muster <clears throat> a lot of focus, a lot of uh, mental resources, that's going to be a tougher thing to do if you really just spent yourself in the gym. If yeah. I could but, add, uh, Alex, but some athletes, okay. some athletes can do it. So, and, and this does speak to the subjectivity we're going to talk quite a bit about in the, in the subsequent questions. Yeah, I agree with me, what, Alex, go ahead. But Jonathan was saying, um, so Friday tends to be like, if I have a midweek spin, like if we're not doing like six weeks straight, Friday tends to be that easy day. Very rarely is Thursday that easy day. So I try not to stack those as well, but if that does happen, the nice thing is normally the way those three strength training sessions go is Tuesday is more of what you'd consider, I guess, a leg day. And then Thursday is more of an arm day. And then Saturday is more of a mix. So if that 
Thursday does fall on the recovery spin day, then at least it's arms. And so the legs still have time to, to recover there. And then the reason I chose morning is I'm not really a morning person. So getting up and riding at sunrise doesn't really suit my brain. I much rather chase the sunset. And then also back to Jonathan's point, our thought was just, if I come back from, if we're stacking them on interval days and I come back and the form's not there, cause I'm, I'm cracked from the ride, then that could cause more damage than being fatigued on an interval day. Yeah. Great points. So I'm going to recap it for people. If I'm on a low volume plan, I'm going to fit in the strength training on the days that I'm not training on the bike. That's a, what Chad's recommendation was, right? If I'm on a mid volume plan, I'll still see if it's possible for me to do the strength training on the days that I'm not on the bike. <clears throat> However, if I feel like I need that recuperative element of a day off, then I won't do that. Instead, I'll be likely to stack it onto a day where I'm doing something that's going to be like sub threshold. Uh, if I'm doing a high volume plan and I feel like I'm bumping up against the stops, I'm going to try to keep the days that are sub threshold, keep them as they are to allow my body to recuperate a bit more. And instead, I'll be tacking it onto a day when I'm doing a bit more work. Regardless, if you have like one recovery day a week, I don't think it's a good day to do gym work. Uh, if yep. you're doing six days of training and then going into that, it might work for you and you can try it for sure. But if you're training six days a week, then you probably want to give yourself one day fully off. Um, it's just, yeah. it would be tough to go seven, you know, I'd be very careful about compromising that one day off. <laughs> I, you might be able to do it two, three, maybe four weeks and then. <laughs> three months down the road, you're like, why am I so tired? So that's the hardest part about all of this is that when you make these changes, you can't judge it based on how you feel one week. You yeah. have to look at how you feel four weeks later after doing it with consistency, because that's For when sure. you start to see the compounding effect. Yeah. So. My brother does the, the first example, which seems to work for him is he's on more of a low volume and he'll do either a ride or a lift. And I think he does two lifting days a week and then he still does Monday completely off. So he's able to get those rides in and then do gym days on the days he's not riding, which for somebody with his goals is actually great for winter as well. Cause what he'll do is he can move those sessions around and like, Oh, it's raining on Thursday. I'll do my gym on Thursday and I'll ride on Friday or whatever. So having that flexibility is also helpful. And I'm sure AT can, can do those calculations for you if you move stuff around. Yes, sir. Plug. Uh, second, yeah, there, thanks, Alex. Adaptive <laughs> training, trainerroad.com. Uh, Chad, I'm going to read the next one. Are the rules for separating strength training from endurance training different when you're lifting heavy versus higher endurance reps versus core strength and activation exercises? Okay. So, <clears throat> brief point. First off, let's let's move away from the use of endurance reps. Uh, you have strength training, you have endurance training, never the twain shall meet. Okay. So, <laughs> and, and it sounds like semantics, but it's not <clears throat> because they are different things and we're chasing different effects. <clears throat> Excuse me. So if you're, if you're going into the gym and you're doing things like wall balls and burpees and body weight squats, jumping rope, all that, I, that actually does qualify as endurance work because of its nature. And that is what it is, but that's, that's not strength training. So you may be in a gym, but that's not strength training, uh, weightlifting. Anytime you're moving a load other than your, your legs against the pedals or your feet against the ground. Strength training doesn't typically happen at 50 to 60 repetitions per minute. We're never moving weight that rapidly. And, and that's, that's a super low turnover on the run cadence on the bike. So it's not even really practical, but that does still qualify for sure as endurance work. That's not something that translates to the gym. So really if you're, if you're asking for rules, there's really just one rule that I've already mentioned. It's fatigue management. So fatigue compounds if you don't get on top of it. And while nutrition can be a really big component of managing your fatigue, I heartily believe that you can't eat your way out of too much training stress. And I know Nate would probably like to argue otherwise. Keegan and <laughs> Sophia, they're really good at nourishing. So it may give you the impression that you can, but no, their bodies have adapted to that stress and they, sure they try. nourish it very well. <laughs> okay. So you have to ask yourself, what sort of combined training load will I face? Or really a better question might be how fatigued will this particular combination leave me? And yes, that does mean there's going to be a bit of trial and error, but that's because there's no one right way. There just isn't. You have to personalize these combinations based on personal training responses. And in this case, training notes or really good memory is vital when you're beginning this this merge between strength training and endurance training, or, you know, more simply concurrent training. 
Mm-hmm. I've gotten a lot of questions on Instagram when I post screenshots because I've started using it recently, but Train Heroic is actually a really good app for tracking this oh, stuff because cool. it'll tell you what you did. Like the last time you did this exercise at the top, it'll tell you like you did five reps of eight and you did this weight and it'll tell you exactly <clears throat> what you did like at the top. So I used to track it in notes, but it was like, wait, when's the last time I did Bulgarian split squats, mm-hmm. you know? So mm-hmm. it's like, it, it recognizes the exercise you're doing and tells you what you were, you were doing last time you did it. So it's a good benchmark of, okay, where should I start? So that's been super helpful. And honestly, every time I post a screenshot, I get like 10 messages. What app is this? So mm. thought uh, I would share it here. Trainer road athlete and strength trainer, Derek Teal. He has a strength training company focused on cyclists called dialed health. His service does that too. Now, Alex, it's pretty sweet. So because then that allows you to keep track of that and to be able to see when you did things at different times and how much nice. it was, you know, um, one thing that I'm looking at with this is the discussion of core strength versus activation versus higher endurance versus lifting heavy. It's kind of like segmenting all of the strength training stuff in there. And if you like lifting just to lift, then you're probably going to want to segment your strength training a bit more, right? In the sense that if you have days, like I'm thinking of Roman, he's an, uh, another trainer road user, extremely fit cyclist from New York and also a really, really strong strength athlete. Like he can lift some serious stuff and he loves that. He loves having days where he goes and lifts heavy. So I know that there are a lot of you listening to this that like to lift heavy and also like to be fast on a bike. Uh, that combination absolutely exists. And in that case, yeah, you're going to have to separate those, your strength training a bit more in my personal experience. I'm not going for one rep maxes or anything like that. In my personal experience, what I've found is that I don't get a whole lot of benefit from being too selective on separating my strength training, like being like today's a core exercise. So I can overlap it with anything, but since tomorrow's a leg exercise, I can't overlap it with anything. And I have not found that to be the case because I don't think I'm pushing it too hard on the strength side. Um, if you're doing body weight work, that sort of thing, you probably don't have to worry a whole lot at the beginning. You'll be super sore if you haven't started doing it because it will be a change in stimulus and something your body's not used to. But if you're doing body weight work and stuff, that's relatively light, I haven't noticed any sort of like benefit in being like, Nope, only legs today or only, you know, anything but legs today. So it's, that's just a, I guess, a personal anecdote I'm going with that. For my three strengths, yell at you the whole ride. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> at first. Right. And then, oh, then yeah. you'll get used to it. Um, for my three strength sessions a week, uh, one of those is just a day dedicated to core work, uh, but I'll say trunk work. Cause I know Chad likes that word better than core. Um, so that's involving everything basically from here. And it's involving it down to my below my butt basically. Um, and that's, so it's a, a lot of work there. And then the other days will be stuff that works everything across my whole body. So it'll be a mix of upper body and lower body, mostly functional movements, which we'll cover uh, in, in a bit here after these questions. So, um, you don't have to be too strict about like, uh, if you're a cyclist and you're not trying to move the needle too much, you don't have to be too strict about separating everything with your strength work just an anecdote. Okay. Third one. Is there a combination of specific type of interval training and a specific type of strength training that should be avoided or perhaps another that pairs particularly well? Okay. So from the first part of this two part, the strength training deep dive in 30, 342 or 343, we discussed the interference effect and there's some, it addresses this question in great depth, but to, to sum it up or sum up some of the findings, when it comes to same day training, sweet spot work prior to core training seems to work quite well. Uh, VO2 max training following heavy strength training apparently pairs pretty nicely, at least in the research. Doesn't mean it's going to work for you, but it does mean it worked significantly well for nicely those as people. in you get results, people, not nicely as in it's going to be any fun. Just <laughs> yeah. so we're clear. No, very, very improbable. <laughs> I, can, I can speak from experience. <laughs> and, and on that note, same day, heavy strength training followed immediately by high intensity interval training. The, there was a study that backed that up as well. So, uh, as well. so again, works for some, doesn't mean it's going to work for you. Maybe. Haven't and won't try that one. <laughs> yeah. And one, and one of the things that you talked about, Chad, is like, I think, was it a three or four hour window was like, Getting to that. If, yep. It kind of like the preferred spacing, if you can. Yep. Yep. Yeah. So strength training followed immediately 
by endurance riding didn't didn't exhibit any of the endurance effect and it, it, i think that was across athletes not even high level from from beginner strength training immediately following endurance training or endurance riding exhi- exerted or exhibited a positive endurance training effect oddly enough so i think that's it, I, I, I give these route. four examples mm-hmm. because i don't want people to sweat the combination nourish appropriately separate by and this is literature based three to six hours seems to be a necessary window. 24 hours is optimal, but you can make really short spans of time between your endurance training and your strength training still work really well, both benefits on both sides of it. I kind of want to stress this point as we deep dive into strength training, it's going to make you try to achieve perfection. But if you are not strength training, just strength train first, like just get in your schedule where you can, and it's not going to be perfect, but it's going to be better than not. We're going to talk about that for sure. So, so again, this is, this goes back to probably taking notes, but you have to pay attention to your strength training and your endurance training workout pairings. And for, for example, my best strength training workouts seem to come about 12 hours after I've done VO2 max work specifically on ops for whatever reason, if I do those in the afternoon, the next day I consistently have really good days in the gym. So, so this is something that that has worked for me. So also note though, that the, the tolerable volume. So combining these two things together is super subjective and it depends on so many things. And we've already touched on a lot of them. One is training history, because if you're not an experienced lifter, you're new to lifting. You need to baby step into this. Don't be bold, be, be air air on the side of, uh, air on the conservative side. What's your allostatic load? You know, what, how, what sort of stressors are you facing in the moment, in the day, in the week? Muscle fiber composition, something you probably won't know, but athletes who are predominantly fast twitch typically take longer to bounce back from strength training sessions. Gender has shown to have an influence, though a subtle one, still one, and it could tie back to that muscle fiber composition issue. Age, no one needs to be told that age will influence their recovery trajectory. This is real, especially when you add strength training on top of endurance training. Uh, Next question. Should I feel my strength training work like I do my endurance training work? Okay. So this will come down to really two things, right? Protein and carbohydrate. So protein, the typical recommendation, uh, ACSM, whatever acronym is is behind it is 0.8 grams per kilogram, all the way up to about 1.2 grams per kilogram. Um, With the addition of endurance training, strength training, that can rise as high as two grams per kilogram. All I'm trying to point out here is that it's a big topic. And because of that, we're going to do, I'm going to do a protein deep dive uh, the next podcast that I'm on, I think a couple of weeks down the road. So this is a bigger topic than we can sum up, but those are the general recommendations. When it comes awesome. to training more metabolically, and Alex talked about, we, we had a talk before the podcast started, he's done, he's doing some very metabolic conditioning and that's all good and fine. If you're lo- uh, piling it on top of what you're already doing, I hope you know it works or you're substituting a VO2 max work, workout in the gym for a VO2 max workout that was to take place on the bike. Um, in, in this case, you feel like your endurance training, just recognize the short duration. I mean, if you're going to be in the gym, God forbid for two hours, you're probably going to need some nourishment during that two hours, but really come into it preloaded. If you're straight out of bed, it's the banana or the gel 10 minutes before getting on the bike during is going to depend on the duration of the workout. But if you're doing 20 or 30 minutes, it's not going to be an issue at all. And then post is obviously a big concern. And post brings us to the next question, which I'll go ahead and read as an endurance athlete. I'm worried about bulking up and messing up my Watts per kg. Should I be worried about this? So this, this has to do with protein intake, right? Nourishment in general, protein specifically, my words of advice are don't fear hypertrophy. Bigger muscles are not a bad thing. Um, and, and getting bigger muscles are way harder than you think they are, especially as an endurance athlete. First off, more muscle mass needs to be nourished. So if you're already probably not feeding yourself well enough, don't expect a bunch of muscle to just suddenly appear on your frame. Secondly, uh, hypertrophy greater, you know, bigger muscles needs high strength training loads. So if you're not really focused on strength training, you're probably not going to bulk up. It's so unlikely. Thirdly, uh, hypertrophy needs sufficient recovery. And let's be honest, us as endurance athletes, we kind of suck at this. We're, we're go, go, go type a, got to do this workout on this day at this time. And I got to follow it up with this one. And, and now we're trying to mesh this with strength training, which means there's going to be less recovery and more work. Chances are you're probably going to sadly undernourish. And then finally, if you can swing it, if you can actually add a little mass to your body, 
most of us can benefit from the addition of a little lean mass. I can't think of any athlete that I interact with or see that couldn't deal with another kilogram of lean mass distributed all across the body. I mean, that's 2.2 pounds of muscle that drives versus flab that rides. I mean, why wouldn't you want that? It's <laughs> worthwhile. I've never heard that one. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Honestly, it's when you talk about, uh, Chad, going back to the neuromuscular coordination that a cyclist needs to be able to, whether it's, uh, effectively produce power in a TT position or sprint or do so on a climb or do so for long periods of time, more muscle within reason. You don't want to be, you know, some big muscle bound Ninja turtle, but more muscle helps in that regard. And especially what strength training does above all is it, is it allows different muscles to work in different ways that ends up making them more capable. So, you know, you talked about Functional. that point where you have muscles that, that kind of like uh, work against each other. And as a result, you're unable to produce as much power or as much speed on the bike as you'd like to. And I know that seems really silly, but that is really common. And that's what you feel that lack of efficiency after you take time off or after you've been training without strength training or doing anything else, just other than riding your bike for a long time that happens. Like we build up those bad habits when our quad is trying to extend or trying to contract. And then we have our hamstrings and everything else also at the same time, pulling kind of in the opposite direction rather than working together. It happens like th this is not uncommon. And when you strength train, it allows you to build this levels of coordination that you just simply can't when you, all you do is pedal the bike. It's super, yeah, super important stuff. You'll feel the difference. Everything just works better. Um, Okay. Sixth question, uh, as an endurance athlete, how much of the following strength, strength training should I be doing legs, core, and upper body? Because there's an, a pop, there's a popular opinion on this Chad that like, all you need to do is core work as a cyclist. And that's it. I mean, there was a whole book about that really. So, uh, yeah, yeah. there's a lot of books about it and there's, man, there's just so many different directions to go. So I try to remind people, I, I think over the course of my training career, when I actually worked directly with people, I trained four or five times as many endurance athletes on the strength side of thing as I did train their endurance end of things. They, they, they had that down or couldn't afford both sides of it, whatever. I trained a lot of people in the gym and nine out of 10 of them were endurance athletes. What I try to remind them on a consistent basis is that we are endurance athletes. We're not strength athletes. Complexity has no place here split routines, push pull routine, undulating periodization, all these things that you can do with your strength training. That's all good and fine from the strength side of things. If you're a strength athlete, trying to be the best strength athlete you can be, but for us, super simple. Uh, when it comes to the movements, press, pull, hinge, squat, more details on that will follow, but it is that simple. We seek modest improvements in our strength capabilities. We're not looking for maximization. So keep it simple, total body every time any more than that. And you're committing yourself to more time in the gym and less time on the bike. So that's your dilemma to weigh based on your current and even your long-term goals. This, this may work for you. This may be what you're after, but you know, ask yourself, what am I first an endurance athlete? Cause if that's the case, too much time in the gym is uh, counterproductive. And of course there are special cases and, and they know, they know who they are. I mean, track sprinters, they're not going to apologize for bulking up for spending inordinate amounts of time in the gym. It's, it's a necessary, uh, trait for them. They have to, they have to have those big muscles, but for most of us, in my opinion, I, I see it as compound movements done with moderate loads and high repetitions. And I'm talking somewhere in the 15 to 20 repetition range, no problem, no reason to not push even further than that into the 20 to 30 range. I know it sounds ridiculously high. And now we're thinking, oh my God, these are endurance reps again. They're not. What we're after here is it, perhaps you've heard the term greasing the groove. You know, we're trying to bed in proper mechanics and that happens with repetition and it's easier to achieve when you're not moving big loads, loads big enough to make your muscles burn, to make you really want to be done with that set of exercises to make you fear the next one. That all happens with those reps. You just, just do more times with a little less weight, but again, injury avoidance. And we address this with these lighter loads, these better movement patterns being reinforced and fatigue management leaving reps in repetition, and we're going to get to that shortly, are the objectives that move us toward this functional strength goal. Uh, well said, Chad. The seventh question, sweet spot sessions <clears throat> in addition to weights completely fry me, but I really want to weight train this time of year and this time of year being hinted at as the post-race season. 
So uh, this is, yeah, uh, common, a it common, is. I guess, uh, request from, from it, people. It, it is. And what, what's the temptation here, but to apply your big engine? I mean, you're really yeah. good at doing more metabolic workouts. I mean, we, most of us, not great at strength training, but we're super good at banging out the repetitions. So we lean toward circuit style training, right? And, and there's not a problem with that, depending on what you're after. But if you're doing a whole bunch of extra exercises and moving from one to the next to the next with little recovery, you're kind of turning this into a VO2 max slash metabolic workout. And that's all good and fine. But again, what are your goals? Um, compound movements like man makers or Turkish getups or those renegade push-ups or thrusters, uh, explosive movements like wall balls, jump rope, whether it's the double unders or singles, box jumps, depth jumps, burpees, all these things have their place, but, and, and, and they check a lot of boxes, but, but they have to be weighted. You have to be training movements and not muscles. So, um, kind of lost the plot there, but mm. what I'm trying to get, get back to is that it, it's an easy temptation to fall into the rut of, I do hard metabolic work on the bike and I'm good at it. So I'm going to do hard metabolic work in the gym because it just feels right to me, but it takes a, it takes a big toll. So, um, and this is a, a side point and I'm not sure how I got here from where we are right now, but <laughs> strength training is a year round commitment or really don't bother. Um, but, but, yeah. but don't worry because maintenance training, which we're going to get to also requires very little. Sorry. I went a little off to off, off track on that one. No worries. But I, th I think Alex, you've noticed this, you mentioned this in the beginning, right? About sweet spot sessions or like, you know, those sort of like harder sessions and addition to training can hurt. Did you find an adaptation period where you got to the point where like, okay, my body's used to this level of compounding stress from these two different things. Um, used, used to it mentally, I guess. <laughs> yeah. I feel like the, the goals in the gym are right now in the off season are pretty big. And we were, you were talking earlier about, am I a strength athlete or am I a cycling athlete? And with this section in cycling being, I guess, relatively aerobic in the grand scheme of things, higher volume zone two, as well as some sweet spot and threshold, we have the, the capacity and room to push it in the gym. So I think as soon as I get used to anything, that's the day that the, the workout changes the next week and I'm no longer used to it. So for sure. And I don't want to pretend that there isn't benefit from, from training this way, but piling really metabolic conditioning on top of sweet spot work, both of which are really take a heavy, heavy toll on energy stores. I mean, again, you can stay on your nutrition to an extent, but again, you can't eat your way out of too much stress. Oh, for sure. And I think maybe the misconception is that the entire workout has to be one or the other. Like we may have mm -hmm. one metabolic circuit within a workout, sure. but the sure. workout started with Romanian deadlifts and Bulgarian split squats and workouts like that. And then it finishes off with a circuit. So it's like you said, we're trying to get after a little bit of everything, but also with my goals being oriented towards the lifetime grand prix and longer stuff, we've mm -hmm. identified a gap being my fat utilization and that I was a very glycolytic athlete coming out of XCO racing. So this combined with some fasted rides, like no breakfast, not eating for the first hour. And then going into fueling regularly and stuff like that. We're looking for a metabolic shift to push up the wattage I can push while burning primarily fat. So again, keep in mind the goals you have and make sure that those are aligned. So you, you just caused a landslide of things to come in for people that are not even remotely close to your level. Alex saying, I need to do fasted training. I need to do all this stuff. I need to get Please fat don't. adapted. <laughs> Gosh, dang it, Alex. Why'd you do that? Um, no, that is a good opportunity to point out the fact that Alex is, is a different subset of even strength athlete in this context. He's a, he's an experienced one. He's got a lot of experience to build any, any training tweaks, anything he decides he wants to try is not just based on the latest. Mm -hmm insert magazine name here article. Yeah. This is, and this then, is true personal experience. If you have any sure. questions on fasted rides, just go to Lee underscore Jonathan <laughs> and press send message and ask him. That's great. Cause that's not my IG handle. That's wonderful. <laughs> <laughs> you messed it up. That's great. Okay. Um, back to his main core part of the question, sweet spot sessions in addition, in addition to weights, completely frying you uh, in this case, go back to what we discussed about spacing things out. That's one of the most productive things you can do. If you're finding that that combination is difficult for you, change it up. 
try pairing sweet spot work with, uh, or sorry, try, try pairing your strength training work with something other than sweet spot work. Yeah, and, uh, and yeah, honestly, there might be athletes out there who have great workouts following sweet spot work. They come into it say. nourished, yeah. they nourish on the bike, they, they nourish during their strength training. However, it may work out for them. This isn't to say this is a bad way to go, but as you pointed yeah. out, it's tough to pair those two things. Yeah. You got to find out what works for you. I personally don't like a uh, sweet spot session the day after gym. In my head, it's because my body has time to have doms. So if I just put it all in one day, it doesn't have time to react. It's just like freaked out. So <laughs> sounds, sci sounds scientific so, to me. Yeah. By, the by the time I get to the next day and it's like, oh, wow, that gym session was hard. And then I do sweet spot and we're in trouble. So I kind of just put it all in one day and let my body <laughs> suffer. <laughs> Let's go to the eighth question. Thoughts on sticking to body weight only as an endurance athlete. I think it's a great approach myself, Chad. Hey, okay. I, there are a lot of upsides. First off, mastering body weight movements, calisthenics, as they're typically called, is a high, high bar. And, and if you don't understand this, pick up a copy of uh, Overcoming Gravity. It's in its second edition right now, written by Stephen Lowe. It'll, it'll blow your mind. Or just go to, to YouTube or the website CaliMove and watch some things that truly body strong athletes can do with just body weight. So, I mean, what, what I'm saying here is that if a generally strong body is your goal, this is an excellent solution. I do see at least one potential limitation in the body weight at some point is probably not going to load your bones sufficiently enough to promote bone growth. And very likely you're going to, you're going to top out, but I, 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 I just don't think it's a bad way to go. If we're talking about the goal of having a strong body, simply, simply a strong body so that you can ride your bike better, you know, resist fatigue longer, maintain coordination longer, all the things that come with having a generally strong body. I don't think there's anything wrong with body weight mm -hmm. strength movements, except that they're probably going to top out or they, they will top out sooner than uh, loaded ones. But think about it. That extra kilo you were worried about is now an extra kilo you're lifting. <laughs> <Good point. laughs> Yes. Right. Well. <laughs> yeah. Um, one thing to add to this, uh, I, I just want to incorporate a live question that just came in. It says during recovery weeks, what is the right level of strength training? And uh, once again, you have to keep intentions in mind. So the goal of a recovery week is to deload your system, right? You've been progressively loading your body with more over the loading weeks that you had. Now you have a deload week being your recovery week. So for strength training, uh, keep in mind that the goal of that week is to accomplish deloading. Uh, in other words, make yourself uh, get a bit of freshness so then you can take on more load moving forward. So this is going to vary for each athlete. For me, I found that I can keep my strength training consistent throughout this time period, uh, throughout the load and deload weeks. And I'm just fine. Unless I'm going through like a really difficult uh, training block where it's, you know, I'm really pushing up against the stops. And in that case, I'll likely do less strenuous strength training, but I'm still going to do something. I've even replaced strength sessions with mobility sessions. Um, something that's more like a, more akin to yoga as well. Uh, yoga can still completely fry you depending on what you're doing, by the way. So, yes. <laughs> um, but I'll make adjustments as I go, but whatever the goal or whatever the, the outcome is, your focus should be to not load your body with too much work. So that probably means that if you're new to strength training, you might go a little bit lighter during those recovery weeks. If you are very experienced with strength training and you aren't trying to push your one rep max or something like that, you can likely just carry on and be okay. And but there's a volume consideration to be made here too, <clears throat> because if you're a low volume athlete or a low volume endurance athlete training three times a week, I've found that I can have athletes train strength, train, continue to strength train almost as usual during a recovery week, because those three days a week that they were on the bike doing hard work, they're now doing easy work. They recover faster. The training load is not as high. So the, the volume might influence it too. You step into higher volume plans, then everything Jonathan just said is probably applicable. Your the, the goal of that week is to shed the fatigue and it's going to be hard to shed it in the face of ample strength work. Mm -hmm. Yeah, for sure. I think you just got to be as, as with all things we've been talking about, just honest with yourself. Like, mm -hmm. If you can handle it, you can handle it. If you can't, there's, there's no like shame. ego involved or shame. Yeah. To, to step away or, or plug it with something else. I do like Jonathan's idea of putting in mobility or some other, even if it's just foam rolling or yoga or whatever it is, yoga can wreck you by the way. Um, just to save that time, I've talked about it before, but time management is super useful. So if you 
you know, spend a week and you give up those strength training sessions, you'll easily find something else that's creeped into its place. So I like still kind of carving out that time on those gym days to do something productive, even if it's an hour long nap. <laughs> hey, exactly. Right. Keep that schedule. <laughs> yeah. I like it. Uh, ninth question thoughts on suspension steps, strap style training, like TRX systems. So these are like the straps that you would hang from a bar or from some sort of hook, something from this, from above you. And then you either hook those to your feet or your hands or anything else, anywhere else on your body to be able to do movements where you are partially suspended. Yeah. So effectively what I just said, all, all the same stuff, because we're still talking about body weight training here. The only difference I think is that it might top out a little bit sooner than if you have a pair of parallettes and a pull-up bar and you're doing handstand push-ups and pistols. I think uh, this might be just slightly more limited. I'm not savvy in, in TRX systems or, or, sus or suspension-based systems, but I do recognize that it's pretty hard to load those outside of body weight. So they're probably going to, and, and they're a little more limited in what you can do with them. Mm -hmm. they so are I, awesome I guess for, you'll tip out a bit sooner. Top out. They are awesome for maintenance and traveling though. They do sell ones mm. that just go on the top of doors. So like in a hotel room or wherever you just put it on the door and close the door. And mm. you can use that as like a, a mobile gym. Like say you're going somewhere where you, you don't have a gym in the hotel or whatever, but you still want to get that maintenance session in. There's some, some good movements in there to not necessarily, like you said, push the, the high weight, but to keep that, that muscle memory going and to keep those sure. movements in your routine. I so really I normally like pack one of those. I like them for, uh, so mountain biking in particular, you do a lot of very dynamic movement where your body is unstable and not on its particular at, or a typical axis than, and position that it sits on a bike. You're dealing with like a lot of lateral movement and like kind of cross functional movement from one side to the other. And it's, I really like it for that level of specificity. You can yeah. make your body pretty unstable with those. And then there's no need to add extra weight. Um, you don't need to do like, you know, a BOSU ball with like a, a board on top of that. And then another ball on top of that, and then add weights. Like you don't have to go crazy with your gym work, keep it simple. Um, but these things in a simple way, create instability that forces you to work on uh, a whole lot of coordination as well. So that can be really helpful. That said, yeah, for sure. this the same thing can be said with, with any sort of weighted exercise as well. And that's it's, what I was going to say. I mean, anything that brings about improvement, absolutely do it. I just think both of these things could top out before they get us to where we want to be. For sure. Yeah. I don't think it's an avenue to be a good strength training athlete, but it is a good alternative mm -hmm. when you don't have a full gym available. Which brings us sure. to, should I consider yoga as strength training since I'm an endurance athlete? Yes. So, so yoga is, is a lot of isometric contractions, right? You know, contracting the muscle without lengthening or shortening it. It can also add elements of heat. If you're doing the, the Bikram or, or some offshoot of that, uh, odd positions lead to flexibility. I mean, it's very much about improving flexibility, but I see yoga as less strength training than flexibility and, or core training, the, the loading of the spine, the joints, the muscles, et cetera. I, I don't think it's going to be sufficient for very long. So I'm going to hit you with a couple of opinions here. First off, do yoga because you like yoga, not because you want to be a faster cyclist. And secondly, I, I prioritize mobility work, you know, flossing muscles, ex doing joint extractions, rolling them, smashing them, all this stuff. I think in the case of an endurance athlete should be prioritized ahead of something like yoga. Yeah. I think that they can complement well. Um, if you have time for all of it, do it all, but, uh, for sure. most of us don't. The mobility work, we've mentioned this so many times. You even recorded a podcast with him with Kelly Sturette. He's incredible, uh, fantastic resource. He's, uh, I know that when you look at him, you'll be like, that is a huge rugby player or power lifter guy, but he also loves to ride bikes and he knows what he's talking about. And he's trained and worked with some of the <clears throat> best cyclists really uh, ever. So he's, uh, he's a great resource on this and his book, uh, becoming a supple leopard should be used like a manual to be able to figure out how to, uh, open up different ranges of motion and address problems that you have with your body. It's just incredible. So, you know, uh, Derek Teal, again, mentioning him dialed health guy, uh, he, he has mentioned even just spending, like, if you're listening to this and you don't do strength training, he's like, just exploring your full range of motion, even just like, start with that. Uh, G even, and that's something Kelly Sred has said as well. He's like, you know, did your shoulders explore their range of motion today? How about your hips? You know, and it's those little things that a lot of the time we, we get so focused on the fact that like, I need to be doing weights and I need to be doing these specific exercises. And then we lose 
we lose the plot. Instead, yeah. it's just focused on making our body more capable. So if that looks like yoga and that's what you can do, that's great. If that looks like anything else like that, like Chad said, that's great. Sure. There might be limitations. It might top out sooner, but the goal is just to make you a more capable, durable, healthy athlete. So one thing I like with this stuff too, is trying to find ways to incorporate it into like day-to-day -day life, like, mm. like, like exploring this range of motion. Like if you can like work like with your laptop in like a couch stretch or something like that, I think it's, it's nice because you're, you're able to incorporate these things. And the first thing most people do when they're like, Oh, I got to add this, like, <laughs> where, where do I have I time to time. Yeah, dedicate to, to this new thing that may or may not add speed where it's like, Oh, I can go ride my bike and see a power meter and get my instant gratification. So I, I like finding ways throughout the day to, to see if I can incorporate a couch stretch while I'm in a meeting or, you know, different things. And walking the dog or whatever it is and and just focusing on those things trying to try to incorporate them into everyday life so it becomes a habit when i when i do those everyday things mm. uh next question says how should i change my strength training as the season progresses uh fantastic well, in other words periodization chad does it apply here as well yeah and, and it does but traditionally <laughs> Let me walk you through this. Uh, tr traditionally, and this is even for endurance athletes, you, you have a period of anatomical adaptation training, right? Where you're getting your body ready to deal with heavier loads. And that can be anywhere from four weeks if you're experienced up to 12 weeks if you're not. Then you segue into strength endurance where, you know, the loads come up a bit and you spend <clears throat> four to six weeks there. And then you eventually move toward that sought after max strength phase for another four to six weeks. And then if you're going to throw in some max power phase, that's another two to four weeks. And then finally you get to maintenance training where you only have to train once a week. So, Oh, so many phases. First, first that, that max strength training is, is all about developing maximum force, right? I find that applicability to be minimal and not really a relevant ceiling, not the one that it's portrayed as being. So I don't have much use for it, except in specialized situations. Same goes for max power. We're trying to improve that rate of force development. Again, I find the applicability minimal. I think better time is spent on developing your anaerobic and aerobic capacity because as endurance athletes, those are far more relevant. All I'm saying is there are other boxes to check first. You can move through that whole progression, but if you're already dealing with a reasonably complex endurance training regime, Man, that's a lot to do. Mm -hmm. Or regimen, sorry. So realistically, I, I combine the first couple, the anatomical adaptation and the strength endurance into a single phase. And that's what you do. And eventually you get to your maintenance phase. So what that means is during base build, you're training for two, maybe three times a week. I like to reserve three times a week for experienced lifters only. You only need two to start. If you find out you can handle two, you can always add that third day, or you can add more sets or more exercises or whatever it is for you, but start conservatively. Then when you move on to your specialty, uh, phases of training and actual racing, you're back into maintenance, same things, just doing it once per week. And then should your strength training aptitude grow, then this whole groove greasing mentality becomes more strength training. You, you, we, we move down the continuum and the movements become paradoxically more basic because now they're heavier and they're lower rep. So for instance, where, where you may have started uh, using high reps on a single arm dumbbell press. Now you're into low reps with heavy load on a barbell bench press. Similarly, we started with single leg split squats and dumbbells carried at the sides. Now you're loading a barbell onto your back and doing full range back squats. So this is, uh, Chad, this is my perspective on this and correct me or, or, or share any contrary opinions. If you have one, you too, Alex, but I think that for a lot of athletes, focusing on periodization where you're getting into max power and everything else is probably, uh, it, it's, it's, it's a bridge too far, perhaps in terms of where you should be right now. A lot of athletes, it's more about just getting used to incorporating strength training into your routine, getting past that initial initial adaptation period, and then just making the habit of strength training. Uh, if you do 100%. the same thing, if you do the same thing every time, like, yeah, you'll get used to that and there'll be, you know, low hanging fruit that you could take advantage of by changing up your routine. Just do different through. exercises. Right. Exactly. It's less about like, <clears throat> so cyclists, if you're hearing this, don't freak out because you don't know how to like periodize through that process. Like Chad was saying, um, really that's like what Chad's talking about is that's traditionally the way that people go about it. That's literally what he said, the word traditionally, <laughs> that's how people go about it. But that doesn't mean that that's the way that you have to go about it. Just, I just, something's better I, than nothing. 
I just firmly believe that things as nuanced as max strength training and max power training have their place, but they're a little too specific for most of our needs. And they're a little too complex to pile on top of what is already probably a reasonably complex training approach. So yeah. it's, it's just a lot to do. And, and by keeping it simple, you, you greatly increase the changes that you'll increase your consistency to a point where you can start to see benefits from your strength training. And of course, diminish that possibility of injury. Yeah. Mm -hmm. My personal experience is exactly what Chad outlined. We take our two weeks off every year. We get back in the gym. That's when the AA comes in. And then that's when I'm doing, you know, body weight and barbell level stuff to reinforce that. And then we get into strength endurance and pretty much we do that until we race. And then we drop from three sessions to two a week when I don't have a race that weekend. And from two to one, when I do have a race that weekend and then two weeks off at the end of the year and rinse repeat. Awesome. Yeah. And I, I don't, I don't bother. I mean, maybe someday when I really want to focus on like, if you're the sort of athlete that really wants to hit one rep max and stretch that and go, you probably already know enough about this sort of thing of, uh, of, of periodizing your strength training that you already know for the rest of us. Yeah, it's all right. Uh, next question. Are any of these suggestions different for multi-sport athletes? Great question. Yeah, for, for sure. They can be, I, again, you don't have to overthink it, but if you want to, if you want to get a little more specific, I'm all for it. I think that uh, multi-sport athletes should favor vertical presses and pulls. So we mentioned press, pull, hinge, and squat overhead, overhead versions of this, or even alternating between horizontal and overhead versions or vertical versions are a good way to go. Just d swimming for obvious reasons. I mean, that, that right there, you need to be able to move your arm overhead and it needs to be the, the, the cuff in particular needs to be strengthened. Um, multi-planar movements. I think in the case of endurance athletes who run doing lateral work, lateral banded drills spring to mind, um, sidestepping basically uh, strengthens muscles that you're not going to target. Otherwise, if you're moving in a, in a single, typically sagittal plane, backward, forward sort of stuff, up, down, um, and incorporate rotation. And with, and this will differ a little bit from what I'm going to talk about next, which is mountain bikers. Rotation as actual rotation. And this is again, due to swimming, but also because there's a little bit of movement with the arms and running. Anyway, it's, it dials back to specificity, <clears throat> but I also think with those four basic exercises that anytime there's an opportunity to incorporate safely rotation, absolutely do it. We don't get enough rotation. We don't move in that plane enough in the gym, but man, do we rely on it in day-to-day -day living. And then, um, sensible <clears throat> specificity enhancements, they're always can encourage. So if there's some way where you recognize that I can make an exercise a little more specific to what I'm going to do on the race course or on the bike, why not, why not at least try it, try to weave it in here and there. What about the same question, but which exercises are best for mountain bikers? Yeah. And the same thing. So minor alterations, <clears throat> sorry, in the interest of specificity. So that could be a grip width when it comes to presses and pulls. So, you know, as a mountain biker, you're probably on a, you know, a flat bar that, that's quite wide, right? Your arms are out. So why not practice pulling if you're doing say a body weight uh, row where you're pulling yourself up to a bar with a grip that emulates how it's going to, how your hands are going to be placed when you're on a mountain bike. Um, same thing goes with pressing. So, so maybe your bench presses are with slightly wider set elbows. Uh, I, I'm all for staggered stances when it comes to your hinge training and your squat training, because that's the position you're going to be on, especially when you're in a high hinge on a mountain bike railing down a hill. I mean, that's, that's the position you'll be in. Why not train in that position? And I do believe that mountain bikers can probably benefit slightly, at least from favoring horizontal presses and pulls over the vertical ones that that's more in their realm of movement when they're on the bike. And in this case, they, I also believe in, in all cases, really incorporating rotation, but in the case of mountain bikers, it's more about resisting rotation because now we're trying to improve stability on varied surfaces. We're not trying to let the trail tell us where to rotate our bodies, whether we're trying to hold our bodies in a particular position and resist that rotation. And there are a lot of ways to do that. And we're going to touch on that when we get to the actual uh, exercise recommendations. Oh, that's so true. The rotation part is key. It's, uh, so in moments when you tend to crash on a mountain bike, it's usually because, uh, there were forces that came in that were required or that were trying to get you to rotate or move in a spe specific direction. And instead of resisting them and having the strength and coordination to do that, you gave in and then they tossed you. Uh, <clears throat> this is really common in turns when you come into a turn faster than you think, and you hit that berm and it compresses and it tosses you instead of you using that berm as a opportunity to pivot, you need strength 
And you need coordination in order to do that. When you come into a drop and you hit that drop and it hits you way harder than you think suspension rebounds and your body isn't ready for that. Once again, you've lost control. And anytime you've lost control, you're prone to crash. So like one way to think about it for mountain bikers is you want to maintain control for more linear feet of that course than you would otherwise. Like that's a very simple way of, of looking at it. Let's say on any course that you spend 25 feet on that portion of that course being out of control. That means 25 feet of that course, you are leaving everything up to chance. If your strength training can decrease that to 12 to 10 to eight to four, then you can ride with so much less anxiety. You can ride with much better uh, economy and energy in store and ready for you to be able to take on the more important things like passing people, right. And winning the race. So it's, it, this is when the rubber meets the road for strength training, particularly in mountain biking, you need to be a dynamic athlete that can respond to really like mechanically complex situations in terms of the loads that your body is going through with you on that bike. Um, yeah, hugely important. Alex is good evidence of that. Okay. Is there any major, major benefit to doing back squats over barbell Bulgarian split, split squats, which we're going to get into that sort of, uh, you're going to be able to see those exercises actually in a little bit. Due to historic knee issues and leg imbalances, I tend to prefer Bulgarian split squats and unilateral squat variations in general. Is doing exclusively single leg squat variations detrimental in any way? So when it comes to endurance athletes, in almost no ways. Uh, show me a study that says otherwise. Uh, they're, they're potentially more damaging, which means bilateral movements are potentially more, uh, I'm sorry, unilateral movements. So what we're talking about are potentially more damaging, and this can lead to longer recovery trajectories. So you can load, if you're doing say a split squat, you can load that leading leg, the squatting leg pretty relatively heavily in, in such a way that it actually inspires more muscle abuse, more muscle trauma. And this can lead to longer recovery trajectories, but this too harkens back to me saying lighter loads, more repetitions, grease the groove, all that stuff. That's really the only downside that the literature presents. And I have combed a lot of it. The upsides, however, uh, it, it's safer just in general. They're, they're typically lighter loads. There is a, a control uh, or a balance challenge that often weaves its way into all of them. But again, they're lightly loaded, relatively speaking. Uh, additional stabilization is required. And this means more muscle recruitment, typically a favorable thing when you're trying to improve neuromuscular communication. You can make them very much more sport specific. I mean, everything we do as endurance athletes is almost entirely unilateral. There aren't too many sports, in fact, that are exclusively bilateral. And really, strength training is the only one that springs to mind. And there are numerous studies supporting similar, even identical effects when comparing bilateral and unilateral training. So as I see it, I, I use bilateral training to mix things up. Otherwise, if I had it my way, it'd be entirely unilateral training. I really prefer the unilateral stuff myself in terms of functional strength training as a cyclist. I find that it allows me to kind of break down the coordination in a more sim <clears throat> simplified manner and be like, now I can work on really keeping this leg stable, just this leg, instead of having to worry about both legs. It just, it, it's like putting bumpers up in one regard when I'm talking about building up control and, mm. and coordination. And, uh, I'll take all the bumpers I can get when bowling and also when strength training. <laughs> so <laughs> Alex, you, you do a fair amount of unilateral exercises too. Isn't that correct? Yeah, I do. I do a mix of both, uh, Bulgarian split squats is a good one for that. And then I also do front squats, front box squats. Mm. So I don't really necessarily favor one over the other, but got a bonus question. How much should I do? I've typically scaled everything off of my one rep max. And this is common for, even if you took like a strength training class in high school or something, this is probably how you were introduced to strength training. If it was through a traditional way. Yep. And this is, this will be a slightly longer answer, but I do think this is extremely relevant. And I'm hoping, even though this is kind of a complex answer that the takeaway is a very straightforward and simple one. And I'm hoping this will help people figure out how to prescribe load when it comes to strength training, which is what we're talking about, strength training load prescription. And one RM in percentage-based loading is pretty much the norm, right? That's, that's what we've done for the longest amount of time, but it's limited as a workload metric. And I'm not going to pretend that the other methods aren't. They all have their limitations. But I'm going to discuss these particular limitations because I think they're harder to overcome than the limitations of the, the system I use and a lot of strength coaches use. So first off, determining your one rep max 
can be pretty laborious and, and potentially dangerous. So, I mean, you tell me, you want to walk into the gym and say today, I'm going to do this exercise and I'm going to take five, 10 minutes to figure out what my one rep max is. And then next time I'll come back and I'll do the lifting. I mean, it's, it's not realistic, especially when you have five, six, seven new exercises in a workout. So determining it is problematic, estimating it, if it's the same limitations, estimating anything does, it, it, it requires a bit of trial and error and you may never be spot on, but you're probably going to be close enough. I estimate Another I issue. can bench press 400 pounds. <laughs> Just so you know, <laughs> only 400. Y'all should know that. It's a good estimate. It's very, <laughs> very impressive. <laughs> yeah. Okay. So additionally, blanket use of percentages of your one RM. So if you're not familiar with the term, one RM is your one repetition max. So what you could move one time and no more and probably barely, but using the, this percentage of one RM in, in a blanket manner is problematic. And let's take a couple examples, a few training to failure at 80% of this. So 80% of your one RM load, the difference between the toll it takes on your body to sit on a bench and pull a cable into your abdomen, you know, seated rows versus a, a backloaded squat, two different things, 80% of one RM to failure is only going to set you back so far during the rows, probably going to have a, a higher consequence with the squats. Performing 10 to 12 reps at 70% of your one RM in an isolation movement, like say a biceps curl versus a compound exercise versus like, like a, I don't know, a, a snatch or something, something that's a lot of muscles or even just a squat again, it's apples and oranges. It's or just different kinds of apples. Anyway, it's hard to compare the two. They take very different tolls on your body as a whole. Hmm. Um, that 70% one RM again, 14 reps can be easy for some on some exercises, totally brutal for others. So, you know, you're good at things you're good at. Your fiber composition is what it is. Uh, whatever explains it, it's, it's not a uh, across the board, doesn't make across the board comparisons feasible. So I look at a couple load prescription alternatives, and I think the two best going are velocity-based and what's called repetitions in reserve-based RPE. We're going to focus on that second one, even though it sounds really complex. So what are repetitions in reserve? This is just an estimate of how much you probably could do. So you pick something up and, and, and you do 10 reps and you think, eh, I could probably do this 15 times, or, or maybe you do it 15 times, but all of this can be related to RPE. And again, bear with me. This is needlessly complex. I'm going to simplify it. But if you were to leave 10 repetitions in reserve, so you have to do 20 reps, but you're going to stop at 10. This would be a three RPE way down low on that zero to 10 or one to 10 RPE scale. If you were to take that set all the way until one to two repetitions in reserve, so you're going to push it up to where you could maybe eke out two more, maybe one more, you're, you're high on the RPE scale, eight or nine RPE, a max effort where you push to failure, leaving no repetitions in reserve. There's your 10 RPE. Personally with this system, I have no use for the translation. I just look at repetitions in reserve. So let me give you a step-by-step -step example of the process to to land at an appropriate repetition in, re in reserve. First, get a sense of what you can move for the prescribed repetitions. So, so 15 times, uh, whatever exercise, whatever weight. This is the, the fact finding mission you have to go on every time you endeavor into a new exercise, right? You have to figure out what you can move. Then you can compare the different repetitions in reserves impact on your endurance training, your fatigue levels, your soreness, your motivation, your recovery duration, such that you learn over time what serves you best. But I want to warn you right now, err conservatively. And the reason is, is that training at six repetitions in reserve. So leaving six repetitions in reserve yields the same results as training to a point of two repetitions in reserve. And that's a recent study that just surfaced. It's a well-formulated study, and it's not the only one that supports the same notion. So it's the same volume, but of course you have to do more sets if you're leaving six in reserve. So you have to, you have to, you have to calculate. You know, if I'm doing less reps per set, going to do more sets, but those sets are going to exhibit less stress. They're going to require a shorter recovery duration, and they're going to benefit you in the same or same, if not similar way, or at least similar ways in terms of strength increases and muscle mass increases, hypertrophic results. Turns out, and, and more and more, more and more studies are piling up to support this, that the optimal is leaving about five reps in reserve, even higher. Some of them have shown 10 reps in reserve. The consensus right now is they don't know where exactly the high end of it is. So it seems like people are landing at five reps in reserve. So this means if you can move a weight 20 times, you're stopping at 15. 
If you want to take it to the extreme end and leave 10 reps in reserve, a weight you can move 20 times, you're only doing 10. Of course, you have to do twice as many sets. So you're still getting the volume, but again, less muscle trauma, less recovery time, less, less uh, central load, et cetera. So you get the same increases in strength and hypertrophy, and you get a quicker return to readiness for your endurance training or even your next strength training session. So with all this in mind, it brings me to two recommendations I feel are very worth consideration. First, avoid training to failure. The, ret- the recovery trajectory is, is untenable for endurance athletes, and they're starting, starting to find that it's not untenable, but just not recommended for strength athletes too. There are better ways. It's not to say failure training doesn't have a place, but that its place isn't the only place as, as it has been. And then the second recommendation is uh, touched on this move lighter loads with greater frequency. Again, 15 to 20 reps, nothing wrong with pushing up to 25, 30 repetition, high repetition training versus low repetition training yields similar growth and strength outcomes. Again, a lot of literature to support this, this whole notion of fiber type specific hypertrophy isn't holding up against good research design. It's kind of fading away or at least there's more research in in opposition of it. So takeaway being is that a wide range of reps and loads is effective. Okay. So you can go heavy, you can go forever. It's entirely up to you. I prefer safe loads done far from failure. Okay. So overall takeaway in the context of training twice a week, strength training twice a week, train six movements, do high rep, you know, which you can move 15 as high as 30 times, go well short of failure, leave five reps in reserve, do this for one to three sets. And this all depends on results. Start with one, see if you can handle two or need to maybe then move up to three, get it done inside of 30 minutes. Chad, I'd have even one more possible avenue for a person to be able to use instead of one rep max for scaling, start with body weight and then work your way up slowly um, over time. That's another option that you can do. And that's probably a, a safe option for sure. Um, granted, you can still get hurt doing body weight exercises, right? If you have bad technique. Um, but if this will allow you to, to start at the beginning to not completely, well, you might still blow yourself up with doms. It happens, but, uh, to probably not completely blow yourself out of the water and then you can work your way up. It also probably works well on the financial side as well. If you have access to a gym, that's one thing, but if you don't have access to a gym and you're doing something at home, you can just pick up heavy things and use them. But if you're looking to you know, build up gym equipment and do all of that, start with your body weight and then just get the weights as you need to get the weights, uh, just kind of piece it together as you go up. So that's another option. I really like the, the great layout though, of the, of the way to incorporate strength training like that, Chad. Um, Thanks. Awesome. Fantastic. So let's do a review and then let's head into some of the exercise recommendations and we can check those out. You got it. So, so first off, I I just want to reiterate a number of things I said, maybe tack on one or two other little tidbits of advice. First off, keep it simple. I've said that already. Press, pull, squat, hinge, keep it short. It's easier to maintain consistency and you can always increase your workload, increase your duration as your body adapts. Uh, Thirdly, favor high reps initially, grease that groove, bed in those mechanics uh, fourthly, don't know if I said this explicitly, but train movements, not muscles, I'm not talking about biceps curls. We're talking about rows. So, so not, not, not just growing the beach muscles, but actually doing something that involves and favors and benefits the entire body. There uh, are some next, curls for good measure. Okay. Nothing wrong with having <laughs> beach muscles. Just <laughs> if you can incorporate that bicep curl into a more usable movement, I'm all for it. <laughs> Next, let fatigue and fear of injury guide your overall workload. Initially, be afraid of getting injured. Be conservative. Uh, Thirdly, uh, thirdly, no, we're well past that. Uh, Exploit more accommodating training phases to learn your limits, to to surmise the benefits. And this is probably going to be transition and base phases. These both take place early in the training cycle. So if you're going to make mistakes, it's a good time to make them. And Endurance training loads are typically lightest in these phases, though sweet spot training does actually challenge that paradigm. So back to the whole balance and figuring out what works for you. Okay. With all that said, mm-hmm. let's just do the exercises. Uh, Jonathan was kind enough to record versions of all these exercises. And I think please we're going to play them. Yeah. Please so, don't judge my form. Uh, <laughs> producer Maxine, thanks actually, for getting these to play. I've already judged your form, but it's pretty <laughs> thanks, good Jeff. in all cases. This is why hey. people have personal trainers. They pick out things you can't see while you're doing it. Thanks, Chad. Appreciate you. Uh, Maxine, do you want to show the first one being the hollow body single arm dumbbell press? 
And then what Chad can do is he can kind of I'm explain right now. what yeah. these look like. Yeah, so, so then people can actually kind of, uh, the listeners can see what it's like. Sure. And for you know people who are watching, you can see it. For people who are listening, go back and look at the videos later, perhaps. But anyway, th so this is a, it's just a hollow body, single arm dumbbell press. So you're in a hollow body posture, which means you're legs are off the floor and ideally your pelvis is tipped up and your shoulder blades are off the floor. And that's key. When those shoulder blades come up, you get a whole lot of abdominal activation. Um, th this is one where you can, uh, I like to resist lower body movement. So as a one arm drive, it tends to pull the legs one side or the other, try to resist that. This is one of those opportunities to resist the rotation that it's trying to inflict on you. I like to do it in a bench because the ground, you can see Jonathan's bottoming out before his range of motion ends. So I prefer to put it upward or uh, raise mm. it up a bit. That's it. Awesome. Next one would be the single arm dumbbell glute press. And this one actually, yeah, this is, um, uh, this is a super effective one for cyclists. I think works on it's a, it's a, a lot a, of glute strength and coordination too. It's a good one. Yeah. There's a lot of posterior activation going on right here while you're in a pressing motion. Mm -hmm. So this, um, the width of the stance can actually really influence where the challenge resides. If you put your feet close together, it becomes very much a hip exercise. I mean, you're still pressing and still gaining that effect, but with the feet wide, not much of a stability challenge, not a heck of a lot of hips bit of hamstrings and calves and whatnot, but mess with the, mess with the stance on this one. Mm. And also that position is a difficult position to get into trying to slide down to your shoulder blades. You'd be surprised if you, if you have long enough legs relative to the height of the bench, you can just do that on the bench. Shoulder blades are down feet press often on the floor and your butt comes off the bench. You're effectively in that same position and it's way easier to get into. Mm. And also if you're watching on YouTube right now, sorry, if the video is a bit, a bit glitchy, we just got a notification from YouTube that they're experiencing streaming problems. So, um, but hopefully you can see some stop motion or something in between there that they can help you figure it out. This one's, uh, this one's really tough, Chad, when you're doing this one, basically, you know, your, your shoulders are on the bench or on some sort of surface, and then you're making your body like an L with your mm -hmm. legs pointing down to the ground like that. It's really easy to let your pelvis drop, to let your hips <laughs> drop. Yeah. And, a lot of your stability comes from your, your glutes too. So it's, it behooves mm -hmm. you to keep them up. Yeah. And, and it's when you're doing the movement, it's easy to focus on the movement of, of pressing that dumbbell upward. And then you forget about what's going on in your core mm -hmm. and your glutes. And you'll notice that you're way less stable when that happens. You're much more stable when you're really focusing on keeping that contraction and that tension through your body and making just, it really feels like you're pushing your hips upward into the sky, but really you're just achieving flat. <laughs> and just, just so. about all of these are rather complex and, and with, with reason in mind. I mean, I actually want these to be a bit of a cognitive challenge. I want you to have to learn how the entire body works together with each of these movements, how pushing the arm affects the hips, how raising the hips affects stability of the rest of the body. They're just, mm -hmm. they're complex for a reason. Yep, for sure. Um, next one is kettlebell gorilla rows. Yeah, so these you can you know understand where their name is derived. It's a very gorilla looking movement, and the way Jonathan's doing it right now is with an alternating. It's a very safe movement to a degree, and that he's setting the weight on the floor and then pulling the next weight. Um, where it's not safe, and I would recommend maybe not jumping into such an extreme posture, is he's completely vertical to the ground. If you can support that, that's all good and fine. I'd prefer people start with a bit of a, even a 45 degree, maybe lower sort of angle so that they're not in such a compromised lumbar position, but that, that's the way this exercise looks. This can be grown to where the hands or the, the kettlebells in this case could use dumbbells, can use gallons of milk, doesn't matter, uh, are, are resting on the ground. Get to a point where you don't rest them on the ground. And then eventually you can grow into what's termed as a crossover movement, whereas one arm comes up, the other descends and you're constantly moving. And that's when it gets super specific to riding a bike. This also offers an opportunity for rotation as his elbow hits its high point. He could turn his shoulder girdle into it such that he, there's a little bit of rotation at the waist and the, and the shoulders are turning away from the hips. Yeah. This one's uh, this one is one where you can do it. Like the kettlebells are fantastic for it. Um, and it's basically like, you just make a U. Uh, it'd be like if you're doing a hamstring stretch almost, but your legs are slightly bent and then you just have the kettlebells to give you a little bit of extra height. But Alex, you mentioned something that you do with deadlifts, and this could also be applicable here as well, Chad. If you have particularly thing, short yeah. or tall legs, which I have, mm -hmm. I have long legs for, for my body, but 
if you want to achieve a flat back, you can stack something, whether it's under your feet or under the kettlebells or whatever you're lifting, right. In this case, mm-hmm. to get more flat. Yeah. And if you're using dumbbells, you can do the same thing. Like obviously kettlebells are nice because they're quite tall, but if you use, if you only have dumbbells available, you could put plates work for me. I put plates underneath my deadlift to raise it four to Mm -hmm. six inches, just because if I hinge all the way to the ground, then that first six inches of lift is compromising my lumber because I'm, I'm bending at the back. So Mm -hmm. same, same with any movement that you're bent over even just taking the time to film yourself from the side just to see how it looks is super helpful to make sure that you're doing it correctly. And again, 100%. another benefit of not going the one rep max route is starting low and building up to it is you have the opportunity to fix these things first before you're getting into the heavy stuff. Mm-hmm. Yep. Uh, next one is another one where this can absolutely apply the pen lay row. Yeah, so this is a similar movement. It's just done with the barbell. So again, I, I can't emphasize enough, a safe hinge angle. So right now he's, he's at the extreme. He's got a 90 degree bend there. It's, it's pretty hefty. So feel free to come out of that, stand a little bit taller and then mimic the same pole. Um, and, and this is an opportunity to vary your grip based on your specificity. So he's got pretty much a mountain bike grip on this. It's overhand and it's wide set. Um, and, and I'm all about specificity. I do believe it's useful. It can get dull though. So if for no other reason than entertainment value or just changing the stimulus, move your hands around, go with a narrower grip, go with an inward grip, go with a mixed grip. I mean, just, just change it up a bit. You're not going to change the exercise so much that it's going to miss the point. Yeah. This one. uh, Oh, sorry. Go ahead, Alex. I was going to say, I do the same one, um, but actually start the bar as if I was going to do a rack pull. So it's at my knees. So I lift it there, stand hinge to only about 45, 50 degrees, do the exercise, stand back up and walk it back. So you're never actually having to lift this from the ground unless you're, unless you're able to obviously, and an advanced strength athlete to have the 90 degree angle that, or you're that working way, with a very light load. I mean, yep. it can be a broomstick. It can be a very mm-hmm. light load. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And, and it's a key to mention before that Alex has mentioned he has for his height, he has shorter legs. So this is why Uh, this is the cool part. You can make all these sort of adjustments and alterations to be able to make it work better, uh, for you. So this one, Chad, when I was doing it, I actually got into what does a hinge situation feel like when I am mountain biking and Mm, descending, I can see that. Yeah. And, and that's one of the cool things that you can do for this, like strength training, especially when you're lifting bars and plates, there's a lot of Olympic, uh, folks that are, you know, Ollie lifters who will be very strict on technique with good reason because they're lifting heavy weights and they don't want to, you know, cause injury or anything else, but there is room to have slightly different technique and to bring in more specificity, uh, like Chad's talking about for mountain biking. Next one, uh, we're going to get into the squat side of things. This is rear foot elevated Bulgarian split squats. This is probably one of my favorite ones for working on stability issues with knees uh, and hips and ankles and feet. It's just a fantastic exercise and elevating the rear foot, I think adds an even uh, better range of motion, deeper range of motion that you can get with it. Mm-hmm. This is go-to bread and butter, uh, endurance strength training. This is what you should be doing as an endurance athlete, because there are so many benefits. I mean, the flexibility, the mobility, the strengthening, so many things that are happening right now. Um, so again, it's a rear foot elevated split squat. Uh, they're often termed Bulgarian split squats, same idea uh, the the rear foot is raised. He's got it raised pretty high. He's got, that's a, that's a difficult get. And it's actually affecting, it's pulling him into a forward lean. He has a mm-hmm. kind of what I would consider a too short stance, but he's what, what I really like is he's got his foot. It's the top of his foot is on the bench. If you put your toes on the bench, it's a serious cheat. There's a, there's a tremendous difference mm-hmm. because then you're deriving quite a lot of power from that rear leg more than you'd recognize until you switch to that flat foot and man, does it change that exercise? But I think his shorts, his strides a little short and then that can lend to knee uh, aggravation. So if you have knee issues, go with the long stride and just trim the range of motion. Don't go so deep. Um, in that case, you may find you have limitations with the trailing legs, hip and uh, quadricep flexibility. So it could pull you into a bit of a forward lean. That's totally permissible. I mean, what we're after here is a big range of motion with that leading leg with minimal assistance from any other part of the body. He's carrying the dumbbells at his hips. That's stage one. You can bring them up to your shoulders. Stage two, you can put them overhead. That is a brutal stage three. I mean, there's all sorts of ways to evolve this exercise to incorporate other parts of the body that 
right now aren't active, but this is the most stable version of it. I would just like to see a longer stride so that he's not stressing that knee. I agree. It would be, and you can see, cause my toe drifts or my knee drifts too far over my toes, right? Uh, too far forward. It's a good indication that it's not a long enough, uh, stride. Next one is box squats, which in this case, we didn't use a box. We used a bench. You can use any mm-hmm. object that's about the right height, right? Chad, anything. We just want something back there that tells you you're achieving depth. Just anything. It could be a personal, <laughs> inappropriate though it may sound, holding a hand. Just you, you just need to know that you've met the range that you're targeting. And with this exercise, why I like box squats so much is you can load them in about, in about a thousand different ways, and you can place your emphasis on first attaining the full range of motion. And what the full range of motion is is for you to determine. I mean, do you want a, a subtle bend that mimics exactly what you would do on the bike? Do you want to get to 90 degrees? Do you want to get below the creases it is? So your hips are lower than your knees. Can you go all the way down without tucking the butt? Um, you decide what that full range is going to be achieve that full range before you start to load this and how you load it. Like I just said, with the previous exercise, you can load it in a number of ways, kettlebells at the hips, at the shoulders, dumbbells, overhead, million different ways to load it so much to be learned from this one without weight. Uh, when you add weight to it, it can a good mask a whole lot, yeah. you know? Yeah. And th- this is why people have mirrors and they strength train. Uh, it's not just for vanity. It's to be able to check your form and to see what you're doing. And, to, and once again, if you have a friend or camera or anything else, it really helps to be able to film that stuff and check it out. It sure does. Yeah. Uh, okay. Now let's get into more hinging movements. So single leg dumbbell deadlift. Okay, so I always prefer the single leg version of any deadlift just because I'm prone to injury with deadlifts. And I think a lot of other people are too. Um, Alex and I talked again before the podcast, he's a, he's a, a long framed fella. So for him to get into a low enough position to pick up a barbell already puts him in a precarious spot, less so when you can actually tip the hips, which is not desirable in this exercise, but you can at least to pick up the weight. And then you can determine what range is allowable without risking injury like you would with a barbell version of this or two leg version of this. But this is another one you can load with anything, you know, gallon of milk works, but a kettlebell, a dumbbell. The key is to um, keep a pretty long standing leg, you know, subtle bend is okay and do not tip the hips. You're trying to activate the back of that supporting leg. So the hamstrings and the glute, especially, but he's also keeping a nice long back with a, you know, flat lumbar. Is, is, is a good looking version of this exercise. And what I Thanks, do like about the, the flexibility of it, the flexibility of the exercise itself is pretty great because like I said, dumbbell, kettlebell, whatever, you can also load it ipsilaterally, which is what, no, he's doing contra, but ipsa, you could hold the weight in the same arm as the standing leg. So if you're standing right legged, mm-hmm. you're holding it in the right side. That's a lot easier to stabilize than what he's doing, which is contralateral or cross body, where it's, this is another opportunity to resist rotation because he's reaching toward the opposite foot, the tendency would be to twist the body. He's not allowing that. Mm -hmm. Yeah. You'll have to fight that. This is one again, fantastic with no weight. I mean, if you're familiar with yoga, what is this? This is similar to like warrior one or two. Uh, I can't remember one of the poses, but um, you know, you can, without weight, you can extend the arms over or outward so that they're parallel with your body in that flat planed position when you're hinged over that these sort of things can really help. And this one will bring out all sorts of instability that you have. I have weak feet, like many cyclists do. And as a result, when I do a lot of these, I have shoes on here because I didn't want to gross the world out with my feet, but, um, it, it, many times I do things barefoot. So then I can actually build some strength in my feet because they aren't very strong. And it can, if you don't, aren't stable down there, this sort of movement really pulls that out and it allows you to focus on it. Just fantastic one. So Love it. Uh, next, our last one is going to be single leg barbell hip thrust. Now I didn't do this with the barbell. Instead, I just grabbed a plate and you can just grab anything heavy or not even, you can use it without weight too. And this work is, a, on this this is a great body weight exercise the, the doing a double leg hip thrust like this probably isn't going to be challenging for too many people, but doing an unweighted single leg version of it will be challenging for just about everybody. It's, it's not, mm-hmm. it's not an easy get. Um, you can start with a, a two leg version, but with this one, the, one tip or thing to point out, I guess, is that the position of the foot can change the exercise pretty noticeably. So if he pulls the foot in toward his butt, he'll get a lot more hamstring, puts it out, shifts more toward the glute, but either way, your foot placement will influence where you feel the most of the stress in, in the, what, whatever belly of whatever muscle it shifts it to. Um, you can load it with a barbell though. I do recommend a pad cause it can get really uncomfortable. 
and uh, he you get you load it with really anything kettlebell dumbbell again be creative but the single leg version of it start with body weight and then and then grow it from there and, and the the comparison between hip thrusts and i think i'm pretty sure it's deadlifts they it, it's hard to differentiate which is the more beneficial exercise it's not hard to differentiate with which is the safer exercise which i wholly believe is is this one mm -hmm. Uh, awesome. So there are some great exercises. We're going to have a blog post and you should follow us over on Instagram because we'll also have a post with all of these exercises. So you can visualize them and see them if you're listening now. So head over to trainer road on Instagram, just look for the name. You'll be able to find it there. Give us a follow and check this out. Share this one with your other cycling friends too. So then they can see these different exercises and then chime in and let us know which exercises you do and how you found them helpful. I think that if we can make that comment section about that, that will be really helpful for a lot of different athletes. Uh, so, uh, it, and it'd be great to have, whether it's, uh, Art O'Connor, listen to this from Wu Car Fit. He trains a lot of athletes for the strength, dialed health, Derek Teal. It'd be great to have you guys in there too. So then we can help a lot of cyclists and get a lot of people together talking about this. Um, Chad, thank you so much for putting together that deep dive. And then also the conversation, Alex, thanks for being here. I'm glad that we had an athlete that believes in strength training, like you do to be able to answer all those questions too. Um, we don't have much time left and I'm thinking that maybe what we'll do is just do one question that we've gotten from a listener, if that's okay. Um, and then we'll, we'll, we'll wrap this one up. Sound good. Sounds good. Cool. Uh, this one's from Duncan. He says, and I think that the reason I'm selecting Duncan's question of the other ones that we had that we could have covered this week is because I think that it allows for a bit more of a, like a varied conversation. He says, due to having a young child who is not sleeping well, hence neither are we, and a demanding job, I'm struggling to complete even a low volume plan consistently. I've had a talk with my wife to see if there's anything we can do to help keep me on a plan and came to the conclusion that until the baby's sleeping better, it will be difficult to be consistent. Sometimes this is the reality and it doesn't have to be because you have a kid. This is just how life goes sometimes. Uh, Chad recently has been having his house torn apart with contractors in there doing stuff. That's tough. Uh, Alex, when he was moving into his house, he was doing crazy stuff with his house there. Wedding, it, it looked like life throws us curveballs. Uh, busy times at work. So don't feel bad if you can't be perfectly consistent. Somebody out there is wonderfully consistent. That's great. That's not you. Don't worry about it. This is one suggestion she came up with was a week training camp when her parents visit about a month before my A event. I know this will not be as good as consistent training, but should I do this? And how would I moderate my effort to ensure I get maximum benefit without digging myself a hole? So the first things first, Duncan, if you're planning on training hard for a week, your plan is to dig yourself a hole. <laughs> so you kind of like intentionally want to do that. We've talked about super compensation before in this podcast, and it's typically where you dose your body with more stress than it's used to. Not something completely, uh, you know, way outside of what it's used to, but you dose your body with more stress than it's used to. And then you allow it an adaptation period thereafter. And you get something called super compensation where your body is able to make uh, significant improvements and adaptations from that period. Training camps. It's really common to see this sort of thing. Training blocks. Uh, people uh, sometimes do this with block periodization, but uh, once you get into that, it gets a little bit different. Uh, but I wanted to talk a little bit about this uh, basically Number one, if you think this is a good idea, Chad, and then Alex, I wanted to get your thoughts on the whole, how do I do this without digging myself in a hole question? So Chad, do you think this is a good idea to do this kind of like in, in I don't know if he's doing this in lieu of, of training regularly. What would you say? I'm a little worried that he said about a month. If about a month is six weeks out, I think this is less risky than if about a month is three weeks out, uh, depending on the proximity to the event, this could be something that he's not going to rebound from in time for the event. Um, and then I would just be consistent with just how much he affects the load that he's carrying up into this point. So if he, if he knows he's you know doing 200 TSS weeks and he's going to go out and do a 400 TSS week. Okay. Maybe go for it again, assuming you're, you're well enough away from your event, but don't shoot for some 500, 600 you know, tripling of what you're, what you're accustomed to. And just hope that the body's going to be shocked so severely that it turns you into twice the athlete you were prior to do it. Yeah. You can't, um, because it's, my fear is that Duncan lets go of doing any work in between now and then, and then just does this week and then hopes mm -hmm. for a similar outcome, right? No, carry a consistent training load into it. 
And then again, I think we've talked about safely mm -hmm. doubling being a, being a training cap. Uh, yep. Yeah. Rule of thumb. Yeah. In terms of training stress and, and Duncan, uh, try to just uh, let go of the low volume plan thing and just do train now. And when you can jump in and let train now suggest a workout for you. Because if the low, not being able to adhere to the low volume plan is an additional source of stress, you don't need that. So just when you're able to train, use train now and get in that workout. And then once you get into that training camp, you know, you might be able to stretch a bit above double if you're really in like unable to be consistent and still get the desired effect. But, uh, you know, you don't want to go too crazy with that week for sure. Alex, uh, how would you recommend that in this case, an athlete go through and they have this week where they can train. And you've done this plenty of times where you get a week off of work and you fit in a lot of training into that. How do they do that without digging themselves in a hole? Yeah, I'm, I may be overreaching the question here and forgive me, Duncan, if this isn't an option, but my, my first step would be realizing how much you can do with little time and given I'm not a parent, but I am in a, in a relationship. So I, I understand how these things work. Jen has her things that she wants to do. And I have my things she want to do. So see if there's just one hour or, you know, and again, not a parent. So if this doesn't work, just disregard it. But if you can just find an hour, certain days a week where I'm going to be on my trainer for this hour, like, is it possible for the wife to watch the kid for just an hour somewhere during the day? Obviously, if that's not an option, it's not an option. And, and we're just going to do the best we can with this week. And then with the week, I would just focus on getting in as much as I could, and then checking in day to day. Again, it should be pretty easy to, to dig yourself a hole if, if you're coming into this with minimal training. <laughs> so, you know, yeah. maybe the, the first day you start with two hours zone two, see how you feel, and then kick it into another day and put in some sweet spot, put in some longer stuff. Um, you didn't mention here what the, the a event was. So specificity would be a piece of that as well. And then also just the mental break, you know, like being a parent can be hard. So, mm -hmm. so using that week to also use the bike as therapy will, will do benefits for you. And then like Jonathan said, if you're coming in pretty low leading up to this, I think you could probably do more than double and be fine. But again, check in with yourself each day and make sure that you're, you're fueling the work. And I would honestly skip like the, the rest day normally in the seven days and just go seven days straight. Cause you know, you're going to get rest in terms of not riding after it. And then if you had to trade consistency before to consistency after I would do it after. So come into that week, do the big seven days, and then make sure you're at least hitting some workouts those next three weeks up into your race. Cause if you do that one week and then you don't ride between that and the race, it's gone. So trying to get in that consistency before and after will, will help. Even if it's three hours a week, like if you can say, okay, Tuesday, Thursday, Saturday, we've agreed that I have an hour to be on the trainer. I would also do it on the trainer because you have very limited time. So that specific specificity and time directly pedaling the entire time will make it more equate to an hour and a half an hour, 15 minute ride for somebody else. So just trying to be as good with the time you have as you can. I would recommend to like, like looking at this mechanically in terms of what you're building. If you have this big training camp opportunity a month before your event, you are not going to be able to build all the fitness you need a month before the event. Like that, that won't happen. Um, <clears throat> instead, what you'll be able to do is you should look at that as a way to boost existing fitness or specify or tailor existing fitness rather than just trying to create it. Uh, it, that, that can be tricky. So in this case, for the workouts that you can fit in, in between now and then I would recommend going for sweet spot work, going for that sort of, you know, threshold, if you can, that sort of work. So with train now, that's going to be the climbing workouts that that'll be suggested to you. Uh, the reason for that is because you're getting more aerobic benefit with less time and that's what you'll want to do. And you'll want to maximize your time there. Uh, you probably, you can mix in some intensity too, to keep it interesting, <clears throat> but just know that if you're doing like 30 thirties and that sort of stuff, that isn't a replacement for that steady state work that you could be getting from sweet spot, particularly when you're volume constrained to this degree. And then like Alex said, once you get into that training camp, uh, that's when you can focus on a bit more specificity for your a event, 
And also don't be afraid to vary the days in your training camp. You don't have to do the same thing every day. So, uh, look at it as like, okay, this day I'll go a bit easier and, uh, maybe I don't even go that long, but, and that day I, even though I spent less time on the biking and I spend more time doing, you know, mobility work, uh, recovery, anything else that you want to do to be able to absorb as much as you can. So don't feel like you just have to, if you have six hours every day that you need to be on the bike for six hours, think of how to make yourself the best athlete for your race. And if you do that, that probably looks like specificity. That probably also looks like you spending some time to make sure that you can continue to complete the workouts throughout the week. So afterward, after you do this camp, it's key that you don't try to just keep things going. Uh, you will have come in volume constrained, then you'll done this big, you'll have done this big week of volume. So you'll be tempted and you probably won't have a whole lot of stress on your system from training before then. So you might even be tempted just to keep carrying on and do extra hard workouts thereafter. Give yourself a week of very easy work. Uh, do that after this week. And I think that that will, you'll, that's going to help you absorb a whole lot more of that training stress that you got, make better adaptations come race day. So Chad, any other recommendations for Duncan? No, oh, sounds good. Cool. Uh, thanks everybody for joining us on this episode. Please share it with your friends. Go check out trainerroad.com and sign up. Uh, adaptive training and plan builder and everything else is going to make you faster than you ever have been for your goal events this year. It's super exciting. So go check that out. Go to trainerroad.com. And once again, head over to our Instagram page so you can see all these strength training exercises that we, sh we talked about. And we'll also be putting them up on trainerroad.com slash blog. So you can check everything out there with some really helpful text and everything else for all of you. So thanks everybody. We will talk to you next time. Thanks everybody. Bye.